here with Scion, and we are going to be talking about our 20 favorite books. We are going to start at 20 and work our way to one, and we will give a little brief explanation of why that book made it to the number that it is. And yeah, we're super excited, man. I hope you guys are having a good week. And uh, here we go. Scion, what do you got to say? How's it going, guys? Thanks for having me on, Josh. <laughs> so this is going to be tons of fun. Oh, rock and roll, man. We're ready to yeah, go. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, before we get started on our top 20, guys, we thought it would be a good idea because, you know, there's too many good books, you know what I mean, to really make like a legit top 20. So we thought it would be cool to just drop a few honorable mentions. So how about you go first, Josh? Absolutely. So I'm going to start off today with one that I actually knocked out of my 20 because I finished a couple books today, and that's going to be Meg by Steve Alton. Awesome. I actually read that this summer, and it was a perfect summertime read. I picked it up at a thrift store, and basically it's just a Jurassic Park with a shark. You know what I mean? There's just graphic, fun stuff happening, and you got a Megalodon. So then the next honorable, unless are we going every other side? Uh yeah, yeah, sure. No, no, let's just go one by one for the All honorable right, cool. mentions, man. But I did want to ask that that is the same Meg that it's Jason with the Jason Statham film adaptation, oh, right? Oh yeah, one? yes. Okay, cool, yes. Cool, cool. And uh, I did not see Jason Statham as after reading the book. Uh, <laughs> Jason Statham is definitely the wrong choice, but that's usually okay. what happens in adaptations. Let's be honest. Yeah. But, this doesn't spoil anything for the story, but that was actually one of the reasons I enjoyed the story so much was yeah. that he was a professor and he was kind of just dorky. He was just your tra traditional, you know, I pictured him wearing like a, uh, a nice button up sweater, like a cardigan and just teaching the class. Definitely not Jason Statham chugging yeah. beers in a bar. <laughs> okay so. cool cool yeah i, I guess and we'll that, check it out then because the movie to me was like a your typical like blockbuster flick but people who yeah. talk about this novel really like like are like this is one of the best like oh, <laughs> action it's adventure like, you know. it's it's you know why it didn't make it in the top 20 is 20 is it's not i wouldn't say it's like a masterpiece but it's just fun it gets you back into like reading for fun. You know what I mean? Like, you pick it up and you just, I blew through it. It was like two days and I just blew through it. I actually had to set it down because it was so exciting. I was like, I'm going to read this in one day and, and, and then what? I'm going to have to go get the next one. <laughs> so Awesome, man. Yeah. I, yeah. I'll definitely add it to the list, man. Cool. It's worth it. It's worth it. Uh, the next one was Magpie Coffin. Oh, man. And I've heard of this. Yeah. Yes. It didn't make it in the top 20, but for me, it started a whole little uh, like uh, avalanche of just reading like horror, like Westerns as a whole. And for me, I didn't even realize that that was a subgenre of horror was like the whole Western horror. And now I've seen, you know, there's like Jack Ketchum wrote some and, and different authors like that that or um, there's Tim Curran. He also re wrote a couple and. Yeah, and so, you know what, man? I'm not sure if this guy wrote horror westerns, but I know he's a really well-renowned horror author who also wrote westerns. His name is a William Johnstone, I think. Oh yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. I think Nick Nick's read a couple or or something like that, and he he mentioned it. But yeah, yeah. Magpie Coffin was super cool. It's another one of those just action move. Like it's like you're watching an action movie. You just you're following this indestructible character who just shoots up the west and what else could you ask for other than some dirty grimy gory horror in the west <laughs> yeah and now now without giving spoilers is the only horror side of it the splatter for that particular novel or okay yes so, okay. it's so more it's of like, a like a splatter punk but just in the west that's awesome. it sounds right so, up my alley man awesome. yeah i mean really the plot as a whole is not um i mean it's interesting don't get me wrong but if I was to review it today, I might have uh, knocked maybe a half a star off to a star off based on uh, plot. And that's ended up being why I kept it out of the top 20 based Got on it. just it cool, really okay. was like a shoot 'em up Western, which is awesome. Don't get yeah, me wrong. Yeah. That's what you want. I mean, it's a, it's literally called a splatter Western. So <laughs> one thing I was always a little confused about that, you know, the, the publisher, I forget which publisher it is that, that puts these, uh, the series out. It's, it's either Deadite Press or, uh, I got it right here. Deadite Press or, uh, Death's, Grindhouse. Head. Death's head. head. That's right. Okay. So Death's Head Death's Press. Head. The, uh, it, 
when they say it's their splatter series, are their novels connected in any way? Because I know they're they're actually written by different authors. So I'm like, I connected, or if it's like the theme of splatter splatter westerns. They mention different characters. I don't want to spoil anything, so I won't. But uh, we will try to keep it spoiler free throughout this. Hopefully, yeah, you yeah, guys. For sure. But uh, hopefully, my radio voice sounds awesome to my subs i hope they're enjoying this <laughs> hey, it, sounds, it sounds awesome to me man that's that's what matters in the end. <laughs> uh but yeah they actually are all connected i did so let's just this is very it's nothing crazy but the next book it references one one of the characters that you meet from the first book which is wiley young's book um and then the next one is hunger on the chisholm trail and he references a town and also a character from that story so that was kind of cool cool okay um, so they are connected, but loosely. Like you could, you don't have to read all of them from beginning to end. Like if you just picked up the next one, yeah. you know what I mean. If you just read Dust, you'd be okay. You know what I mean. You kind just of like maybe... Steve, Stephen King and his Dark Tower series. Exactly. Yeah, There's yeah, Easter cool. eggs. There are Easter eggs. So uh, yeah, I'll do the the next one is. Yeah. Um, I did Dreaming at the Top of My Lungs. That was uh the most recent story collection it was basically going to be in this but i just wanted to diversify my top 20 a little bit more so it's probably 21 on the list right now it was really good outstanding writing and there's a story for everybody um get a little bit of cosmic horror you know there's one story that i didn't even talk about in my review that there's an alien that's like living with this family for a while and it's just super like there's just different different stories for everybody and uh yeah definitely if you haven't checked out israel finn's uh collection it's definitely worth it um yeah, absolutely, and then man. And like he's a, he's an indie author right yes yeah that yeah, was yeah. that was definitely i think that was self-pub um so that was pretty cool that and you can tell that uh he's kind of honed his craft over a time period he came off like he's been writing for a while and when you that, were reading you know what i mean i mean that's like the biggest compliment i think you can give an indie author because like with no editor and i'm assuming he might have got it edited somewhere else but i'm assuming like obviously like it's your story your writing it's really cool to know that like someone who's never read you before says that like you it sounds like wow i wouldn't have guessed that this was someone who just you know what I mean? Put this together essentially by himself. So, yeah. Oh yeah, and if you and if you look at his collection and read it, and if you didn't know it was indie, you wouldn't know. And that's wow. if that's not the biggest compliment you can probably give an indie <laughs> author. Yeah, I, it's true though. Like yeah. if I feel like indie gets a knock because we've talked about it. You know, there's there's yeah. different story. They'll be put out and and not quite up to snuff. And and if people in indie just took their time a little bit more, like obviously Israel did because, yeah. you know, he had submitted story from when I, I did a little more research and watched a couple other people's reviews and uh, well read beard had mentioned like that he had, he had been in other collections, but like anthologies with other authors. And so I feel like he's been writing for, it just came off like that. And it was, yeah, his first man, book, I, so yeah, I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if any of these stories were in those anthologies, which is why it's awesome that that should make, I hopefully that gets him a bigger audience if they liked everything else in those books, but Absolutely. I'll definitely check him out, man, especially like uh, he's a really cool guy in his Instagram too. So yeah, he's definitely one I, I need to read. It was super, yeah, it's just, it's awesome. Um, and then the next one, I, I think I have like four or five here, but um, the yeah, next yeah. one was The the Wise Man's Fear, and that's by uh, Patrick Rothfuss. Um, okay. I felt that it dragged a little bit in the beginning. That was a classic second fantasy story in a series. In, in every trilogy of fantasy, you will run into a little bit of a slog, and it usually is in the second book. But yeah. that being said, there was a great amount of world building in this one, and that's what set it apart for me. And it almost made it in also, but um, I'm also just... I, I get that art is a, it's an art form to write books, but, geez, it's been eight years, and we're still waiting for The Doors of Stone. But uh, luckily, there is hundreds of other books I need to read before then, so... Patrick, take your time. I respect you, but yeah, dude. I mean, there's that's. I mean, <laughs> that there's years. nothing. No horror novel will ever be scarier than my TBR. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, but it was cool because that one he goes into a school. Well, uh, no, the school is in the first one. The second one, he's he gets like a job with this like rich guy, 
And it just was a cool dynamic of the story where he gets more into the fantasy side of things where there's a lot more magic and things like that. So I did enjoy the, the wise man's fear for that. And then uh, the, the the last one is actually by this uh, guy named Sion Das, and he released this story collection called uh, Buried with the Night. Wow, wow, man. And, and yeah, so <laughs> I wanted to to give him a shout out. He's a, He's got a... Got a good thing going there, and I also well, I, I really enjoyed his story, Dar Darjeeling. That was my favorite one. So I've talked about it 150 times. It's probably one of my top top 10 short stories that I've read. So it yeah. was a ton of fun to write, and I'm glad. Like you're one of the few reviewers that actually touched on like uh, like like the gore in that story. No spoilers was really fun to write, but I had a lot more fun. I think trying my best to capture what it would feel like to be in this like really foggy Himalayan town. So thanks, man. That was my favorite aspect of that story was I'd say that setting that you really, my favorite type of horror is that um, the ambiance of the, you know, just that dark, like, okay, there's fog, there's these mountains, you don't know what's in the woods. You know, like I grew up in the woods and like hanging out and, and camping. And to me, that's scary. Like when you're that like five-year-old kid by the fire and you just hear something out in the woods and you're like, what was that? That's, that's, that's that natural fear. And when you were writing that, those scenes, it captured it. So I thought that, that was really cool. So it deserves so much to be fun. pointed yeah. out. <laughs> yeah, well, so. I, I, I actually never, uh, I've never been there, but my dad, ha my dad uh, used to go there a lot when he was a scout. So he used to tell me stories about just how like just creepy and ominous everything was over there. So I thought it would be awesome to try to see if I can put him back there. But yeah, he enjoyed it for sure, but definitely wasn't a huge fan of the core, but that I got a, I, that was definitely my favorite part also. Uh, Cause That's it got cool. some, I had, I was, I wasn't probably expecting it to be as gory as it turned out, but by the end of it, I was like, I, I probably want to submit it for a year's best hardcore horror. <laughs> Cause <laughs> I was like, you know, I've been a fan of that series by Red Room Press. I think they're a subset of Comic Press. And I was like, it would be awesome if I uh, one of my stories got in, and it did. So I was really happy about that. But I think it so qualifies much. as hardcore. Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah. <laughs> cool, so, man. Awesome, man. Yeah. All right. Your, your turn for your honorable yeah, mention. Okay. So, and we got like so much to talk about. So I'm just going to kind of breeze through these a little because we can spend all day talking about each one of these, obviously. But okay. Exactly. So my first honorable mention uh it goes to dark matter by blake crouch the only reason this is not in my top five right now is because i'm still reading it so it, i'd be a complete oh. liar i'd be a complete <laughs> liar if i put it there and i pretend like i finished it but i i mean i i don't know what blake crouch can do wrong for me to want to take it out of that spot by the end of it because this is hands down the the most fun I've had listening to an audiobook, especially ever, man. It is Crouch's writing is so seamless. It's 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 not literary, but it holds the same weight. That's the best way I can describe exactly. it. And I I don't know how I didn't read this guy before, man. And it's just such uh, the writing is one thing. The the storytelling of this man. I'm not a huge sci-fi fan, and Josh knows this, but. I if this is the kind of sci-fi he writes, I will read everything. <laughs> I'll read all his books in the span of a week. Uh, oh, but yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> you got it. Yep. <laughs> the second honorable mention I had was *The Silent Patient* by Alex Michaeldes. So this story definitely uh, intrigued me. The premise, and on top of everyone raving about it, I was like, I gotta check it out, even though I don't read this genre that much. And I'm glad I did because for a commercially successful thriller novel it is one of the most original plots i've read like period dude the the dialogue is so good the and alex mccaldes was a screenwriter actually before and oh, it's cool because okay. i don't want to spoil anything but at the end of this the audiobook he gave a, someone uh interviewed him and he said he was going to quit writing altogether because he tried screenwriting and then he ended up working in a psych ward for a bit and that's where he got the inspiration to write this. And hands down, it is one of the best endings of all time. It is so oh, good. Nice. The only reason it is not on this list, and I'm going to get a lot of flack for my number 20 after saying all this, but the only reason it's not on my top 20 is 
I just I'm not saying every book on my top 20 is better than that one, but what I am saying is those books mean a lot more to me. So that's the only reason. But yeah, so The Silent Patient by Alex Michaeldes. Now, the third honorable mention I have is Punch by J.R. Park. This is just one of my uh, one of the coolest slasher novels I've ever read, dude. And no one knows about it. It's so good. Yeah. So it's Punch by J.R. Park. Uh, it I'm is basically, notes. yeah, man, it's a it's a really gritty, well-written, brutal revenge tale. And it basically serves as kind of a throwback to slashers from the 90s and mid-2000s, early 2000s, yeah, yeah. not really mid-2000s. And uh, yeah, J.R. Park is just, his prose is, it's real good, man. It's actually very similar to Blake Crouch's prose, now that I think about it, in the sense, his writing style, it's it's not literary, but it, it holds the same amount of weight. And it's palatable. It's very easy to read. And that's absolutely. So and successful. let me tell you, yeah. it's been a while when I read that book. It was a while since I've cited so hard <laughs> with the with the main villain of that story. So I highly recommend. That's so much fun though when that happens, isn't oh, it? Oh, dude, it is dark. You're like, you're yeah. like, yes. <laughs> it's dark and it's awesome. You're just rooting for him the whole time. And if anyone reads that and thinks some messed up in the head, it's, you're probably kind of right. But oh well, it's it's definitely in my honorable mentions. And so the next one is a, a book called The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. This is basically I don't want to give away anything about this. And it's by Mark Haddon or Hayden. I'm not sure he had pronounced pronounce his name, but it's basically uh it's your it's not your standard mystery. I don't want to give anything away, but it's a very unique slow burn story with a very interesting main character. And that's all I want to say about it, because I I was I read it a while back, so I don't remember everything about it. But I just remember really loving uh, relating to dark humor for the first time <laughs> reading. Yeah. And I was around. I know I was between the ages of. 11, which is way too young for this book, by the way. It was between the ages of 11 <laughs> and and 13 when I read it. And it just, it, it spoke to my, like, sensibilities regarding my humor. So I highly, highly recommend that if you guys want to read a very good mystery with, it's it which is told in a, quite a unique way with a really entertaining, interesting main character. So that's awesome. the, curious, the Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime by Mark Haddon. What and, a frick title though let's just say yeah that. yeah it sounds it sounds like a patrick stump from fallout boy wrote this <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so the the next book is i'm thinking of ending things by ian reed you know a lot of people haven't heard of heard about. Joking. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's been everywhere but it really is like i'm always the person that's like immediately skeptical when some someone's in the hype train about something and i read this book actually well well before I had uh, heard that there was a film adaptation being made. This book is not only unique in the way the story unfolds. I listened to the audiobook. I don't think anything will ever beat how creeped out I was by it. It's the creepiest awesome. audiobook experience I've ever had. Anyone who wants to check this book out, man, you need to do the audiobook version because it's it's so well done. The last the and it is a it's a master class in slow burn suspense. That's really what it is. Uh, you you only have really a very small set of characters, and you're in one character's head throughout the whole story. The last hour of the audiobook, I was supposed to to go to sleep because I had to get up in the morning to to. <laughs> I hope he never hears this, but to help one of my friends named Daniel do something, I ended up canceling and making something up because. I had to stay up, dude. It was so good. Okay, and, over, man. Oh, yeah, dude. The last hour was absolutely phenomenal, and I don't think I'll ever check out the film because apparently, from what I've heard, they, they uh, Charlie Kaufman did something totally different with the ending. Uh, and the ending to this is really what, what makes this book. Yeah. And the journey is very good, too, like in terms of showing, like Ian Reed shows us how how to really craft suspense, but the ending is where it, where it's at for this book. And if they change that, I'm skeptical. So yeah. I'll, I might check I, it out one the, day, but yeah. Yeah, I, I respect that because I feel that the one, there's a couple things you shouldn't change when you make the adaptation as a consumer of books. Uh, and I would feel that the ending is, is one of the most pivotal 
thing. That that's what the author wanted. So I feel like if you're changing the the ending, then you're changing the trajectory of the story. You know, I get that you have to change different things throughout to make it more palatable for like a a TV or a movie. You know what I mean? I get that. You got to drive the plot a little bit quicker because people's attention spans are slightly smaller when you're. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. You only got an hour. You got an hour and a half. You don't have eight hours to build this setting and build the character work and all that. So I get it, but changing the ending is silly. So I would be skeptical yeah, also. <laughs> and, and the ending, no spoilers again, the ending in the book is something while if this really is a book, it felt like, you know what, man, I'm going to go out on a limb and say Ian Reed meant for this to be consumed through audiobook first and foremost, because the way the ending unfolds, you'll see why, but, and they that's couldn't awesome. have captured it really on film, I think. So maybe that's why they went with a different ending. But again, the second, the trailer looked awesome, but the second I found out Charlie Kaufman's directing it, he's, he's one of my favorite filmmakers, but I was like, man, this guy loves to make his movies just super. He just likes to create walls and break them, not even fourth wall breaking. He'll just put up walls so he can break them down and add sense. late. Yeah, add layers to all his stories. And this is already a layered piece of fiction. So I was like, I'm not sure if it's going to get muddled or not. But yeah, anyway, so that's that. And my final honorable mention is Full Dark, No Stars by Stephen King. So oh, this, nice. I've, I guess this is a good time to mention something about my top 22. You won't see a lot of King love in there. And first, that that's primarily because uh, there's so many great authors you know, on our top 20 list, I figured I only wanted to to limit each author to one book. Otherwise, there's easily two or three of these authors who if I if I they have such incredible bodies of work that if I tried reaching for more than one or two of their books, it, they would make up the whole list. So exactly. Stephen King is one of those authors. And actually, I might get hate for this, but I'm not a huge fan of his long fiction. I've not now granted, I haven't read a lot of it, but from what I have read, I'm just not a fan of he it's like he does world building for things that don't require world building. You know what I mean? <laughs> this is true. <laughs> I can see that as a uh, diehard Stephen King fan. I, uh, yes, I, I get where you're coming from. I just choose not to talk to uh, talk about him as much either, because I feel like he's a book to crutch. You know, there's a rumor out there that if you, if you include Stephen King, in your videos if you tag him you get more views and i take pride in trying to limit that as much as possible so bury yeah. me where you want to but you know there's other authors out there as much as i love stephen king there's yep. other and, authors out. and exactly <laughs> i haven't yeah for that reason i'm not a fan of his longer fiction in terms of his short stories dude i've only finished one of his short story collections in its entirety not because there, I feel it, his writing as a short storyteller is, it's unrivaled. I've never, oh, yeah. this dude is a short story factory. Like his stories are so dense, layered, heartfelt, scary as hell, dark as hell. It's just, they're unbeatable to me. And, and, and I don't think he gets enough credit for his short story collections. Even and he says that he says that same thing. He <laughs> says it's, a, yeah. he says it's an art form. I re I was watching an interview that he did and he said, um, short story writing is an art form. And if you don't do it, it's, it's, you lose the ability to, because you have to wrap this story up in such a short, sometimes it gets, you get carried away and you start adding things. And then all of a sudden it's not a short story. It's very, I guess it's very hard. And especially if you don't do it, like while he writes all these longer books and these huge novels and things like that. And then all of a sudden he, you know, he forgets how to do it. It's like riding a bike. Exactly, so. man. I agree. And, uh, yeah, but out of, because I haven't re I have read a ton of his short fiction in many collections, but I've not finished them. The one collection I have finished is Full Dark, No Stars. And have you read it? Well, full Dark? No, I haven't. I own it, but I, I haven't read it yet. So Yeah, dude, it, it's, it's basically, I don't want to give away one thing about it. It's one of the most entertaining, uh, well-paced. That's the main thing. I was like, man, he really, if all his stuff was this well-paced, I'd be, he, he'd be unbeatable. You know what I mean? But, oh, uh, yeah. Pacing was amazing, and the prose in this was especially beautiful in all these stories. So, yeah, that's my final uh, final honorable mention, Full Dark, No Star. Nice. Place. Yeah. All right, man. Let's get to it. <laughs> Number 20, right? 
Number 20, man. You go first, and I guess we'll go one by one. And uh, this will all be timestamped for you guys. Yeah, absolutely. So my number 20 is going to be Parasite Milk by Carlton Melanick III. Melanick? Yes. Uh, So it was actually one of the first novellas that I read of his, and it was shortly after I had read another Bizarro book that will uh, hopefully be on this list also and I was like who's this guy because they say that he's the most well-known of the bizarro horror section and I first of all didn't even know that was a thing and then I read it and it was one of the first books I've ever read in my life that I cringed hard at a certain scene in the book if you read it for yourself you will know but there's this gentleman and he goes to this alien planet and you know, it's it's really the plot is not groundbreaking here. You're yeah. reading this for pure entertainment value, and you just you read it and you're like cringing and you're like, what the heck is he? Re-? He's got a beautiful mind. If I'm if I'm being honest, I don't know the gentleman. Never had a conversation with the author, but Carlton Melanick, you are an um, an very interesting man with your thought processes and I respect you as a artist. <laughs> That's oh, where dude, I'm gonna I, go. <laughs> I've, I've heard uh, so much about Carlton Melanick. He's like the, basically the God tier for a uh, bizarro fiction. That's what I've heard. Yeah. Right? And yeah. I'll tell you what, it's something different, man. If you're, if you want to try something different, try some bizarro horror out. That's what I'm going to tell you. Just go pick up any one of his books and uh, absolutely mine... man. And uh, he, he, a lot of his titles are like, I want to keep this podcast as clean as possible, so I can't even say some <laughs> yeah. of his titles. But yeah, yeah. He, the dude's imagination just blows me away, even from his synopses that I've read. So I'm like, I definitely need to check him out. Cool map. Awesome. I would say I would say try Parasite Milk out because that dude. There's yeah. a scene in there, and it well, it blends. It's kind of like the Blake, Blake Crouch thing. He yeah. blends extreme horror with some sci-fi, and it's really entertaining. So. Okay, so before I start my top 20, I just want it to be known that, uh, like I said before, I didn't read a lot in high school, but I read a ton in middle school. And uh, I really started getting into literature and more like darker fiction, horror, when I was a senior in high school, which was about seven years ago. So I tried to include books that I had read all the way back in middle school as well. So and I figured I'd leave those at the tail end of my list. So that's why what the book I'm going to start with people might be like, how is that in a, in the top 20? And I'll give my explanation for it. And number 20 is uh, Goosebumps number 56, The Curse of Camp Coal Lake by R.L. Stein, man. And I'm sure, like, have you heard of R.L. Stein? <laughs> I have no idea who he is. Yeah, yeah, dude. All. Exactly. Is that's why I wanted small, to... He's like a little Italian guy, right? And he writes some horror. No, that's Martin Scorsese, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but yes, okay, so I was around 10 years old when I read this man, and I remember this book because of how fun and how dark it was. At 10 years old, man, I had never read anything this dark. Oh, yeah. And I, when I went back, uh, you know, a few days ago when we were creating this list to look at what people thought of this, I was like, it's not just me. People are like, this is might be the darkest Goosebump, uh, Goosebumps book out there. It's about a girl named Sarah who goes to this camp called Camp Coal Lake. And the lake is just grimy and everyone's just horrible to her. She hates her bunkmates, and she decides she's going to pretend to drown herself. What a twist, right, for a kid's horror. <laughs> she's like, I must drown myself, and everyone feels sorry for me. But things don't go exactly like that, and there's something else in the lake. And it is just – it is – I don't think you can write dark fiction for children better than R.L. Stein proves, like better than the he teams. did here. Yeah. And – this this book solely is responsible for me to checking out all the other Goosebumps books and checking out the TV show. And uh, the first VHS tape I saw of the show was uh, a Welcome to the Dead House, which is actually Goosebumps book number one. And that is also very creepy. So it was just yeah. great for me getting into uh, darker horror as a whole. And this obviously led me to check out Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, which I didn't include here for the sole reason that I feel that book is known more for its illustrations, if I'm being honest, than the actual stories. So, but that was awesome. And uh, yeah, I highly recommend, you can enjoy this book as an adult too. I actually checked it out three days ago. It's a really (laughs) short read. And I think it really will uh, make you appreciate what R.L. Stein did for 
getting uh, kids into horror more. So that's one number 20. Oh, yeah. Genius. He's a genius author. Uh, I feel like everybody that probably is reading what we read now definitely read some Arl Stein when they were growing up who can't Absolutely, go wrong man and i know like there was a bunch of fear street books that i read too but i don't remember any of them so that's why i didn't include that but i could have yeah. listed uh i wanted to go with the curse of camp coley because it really is uh one of the darker books and the first one i started with so yeah the first book i ever read by myself was a goosebumps and it was um it was the one with the werewolf i just couldn't even remember what it was where the kid turned you know it's the yeah. werewolves one. That was the first one. I just you'll oh, never it? forget it. Because, I'm not know. sure. There's one called I think the Werewolf of Fever Swamp. I'm not sure if that's the one. Though. It was something like that. Yeah. Or and bad hair, just, bad hair day, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was the yeah, first yeah, one yeah. I read. I was, you, you'll never forget it because you're like, hey, I remember that. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, and and like Sion said, uh, similarly similarly to me, I I didn't read a lot growing up. Uh, yeah. I I kind of uh, got carried away with just life and things that I thought were a little bit more important. And uh, recently I've actually started reading, I'd say probably in the last three, four years. Um, I just always was, always made the excuse that I was too busy. You know, I, I, I'm working and, you know, I have the girlfriend at the time and things like that. And, and uh, it's only recently that I really made the choice, the decision to uh, better allocate my time to doing doing the things that I enjoy, which is reading. And I also can thank Stephen King for that because uh, he kind of reinvigorated. If I'm being honest, man, he did. Uh, that was <laughs> yeah. one of the first books I picked up. And then I was like, hey, you know what? We're running with it. So, all right. So number 19 is going to be a weird one. It's going to be Deadwood by Pete Baxter. I've talked about it on the channel before, but it was kind of a blindsided book for me. It was the first Western novel I've ever read. Um, I did grow up watching the Western movies, you know, Clint Eastwood and all that. But um, this one is it's it's set in Tombstone and you got Wild Bill Hickok. And uh, there's just multiple twists and turns throughout the novel. Each section, you follow a different character, a different main character. And really where Pete Dexter shines in his writing is breaking down the characters. And, and basically, you enter the mind of different people at the same time when wild bill hickok hit that town and you kind of see the aging gunslinger and and see that side of him where he's not quite as perfect as he was when he was in his 20s you know and shooting up the town now you see a 40 to 50 year old guy and he's just not quite as quick but he's still respected so it's just really cool to see that and see that you know um even that bulletproof top of the line guy can still be um human so it was just really cool it was it was more of a tale of humans in the west <laughs> yeah man it's awesome it's like a humanized yeah. gunslinger tale it sounds great yeah is it, is it, it does it have any relation to the hbo series they yeah it, i believe that the hbo i haven't seen the hbo oh, series. oh i that dude i gotta check out this novel i love that series it's great. yeah i it is based on the pete dexter novel yes okay which cool. is really funny that i know that that's very popular but i'm not much of a tv guy i'm terrible with tv i yep. but i read that novel and and i read it for a book club and they were and i was like really we're reading a western i was like come on man like there's no way i'm gonna enjoy that dude it's graphic <laughs> yeah. it's great it's dark oh it's, dude in the show they're cursing left and right i'm not sure if it's like that yeah. in the book yeah i mean it's not well, okay, yeah. I mean, there's well, there's Calamity Jane. This isn't a spoiler, but Calamity Jane yeah. is like something else, man. And I, when I did my book club interview or meeting, we did a Zoom meeting, and I was like, I really like Calamity Jane as a character because she was like this badass kind of feminine, hardcore chick. And they were like, no, she was annoying. And I was like, the only one that thought she was really fun. So that's interesting. If you guys ever read it, let me know if you enjoy Calamity Jane's character. Because I was like, I thought she was well-written and she was fun and she would cuss and shoot up, you know, just be silly. And so, all right, what's your 19? <laughs> that's awesome, man. Yeah. So, okay, cool. My my number 19 is a, a much more, well, I, I, I guess the camp, Curse of Camp Colic is well-known, but kind of forgotten. This book is not forgotten, I know. Many people, uh, everyone's almost heard of it, I think. Everyone who grew up around, like, the same age as us, it's Hatchet by Gary Paulson. Oh, this great is, book, yeah. 
Yep. Yeah. So this is just uh, I won't really get into the synopsis of this. It's basically. I, and I don't mean this in like a slight in any way. It's essentially kind of like castaway for a younger audience. It yeah. is. It is. And I, I think I read this when I was around 10 to 12. And it is the first novel that. I got to read that navigated themes such as like death, isolation, self-confidence, perseverance. And it really was uh, something that I'll never forget because my mom bought it from me. I remember from Barnes and Nobles and she wanted me to get more into reading like 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 well-written fiction. And I think this one either this was a Newbery Prize nominee and oh. uh, I, I must must have won something else. I'm not sure what, but I loved it instantly. I reread it, I think, three times in a row. And, you know, it's and I found out looking at it this week that it's part of a series, which I didn't know. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so that's just another excuse for me to reread it like uh, now that I'm a grown man. But uh, people really hate this book on Goodreads for some reason, and they hate on the fact that it's very repetitive and it's very basic. I think <laughs> reading books gear towards children as an adult and sliding it for it being <laughs> very easy to read and understandable and not as mature is just very stupid to me if i'm being honest well, so it makes absolute no that sense. makes me appreciate it more and it makes me feel like if i ever have kids one day i will def this is like the kind of book i'd want them to read because it, it forces them kind of to start forming their own thoughts about like the world in a very like age appropriate way and I had to include it because it it really is a it really means a lot to me, man. And and the, I remember the atmosphere. Paulson's a great writer. Like yes. yeah, forget about like being a children's book, man. Go pick it up now. It, the atmosphere and setting he creates is just terrific. It made me completely afraid of being alone for a while. And just the thought of even I won't spoil this, it, although it might be in the Goodreads synopsis, but even the way the plane why the plane crashes and i think he's on on his way to canada in the story why it crashes how he deals with it what he thinks of uh why oh. it crashes like like own character's thoughts on that it's very very dark for oh yeah uh and it's but it's very it's beautifully done and yeah it has to be in my top 20 so i put it at number 19. oh i'll never forget that one too that was a great story definitely if you guys have not read that check that one out it was it was outstanding so uh, number 18 for me is actually the book that I added today. And um, I have not filmed a video for it yet. I don't know what to think. Um, I read Jack Ketchum's The Girl Next Door. And what um, a roller coaster ride that is. I don't know what to say, really. Um, I do not recommend this book. Uh, let Just maybe find it on your own. Uh, it is not for the weak stomach person. Um, and it's the reason why that it's so it sits with me so much is that it's not a horror novel where somebody is writing a fiction scene, like a, a piece of fiction where there is graphic abuse or um, violence being done to children. It is not a fictional tale of this. It, it is based on a true story. I haven't dug any more into it because really, frankly, I don't think I can handle any more of it today. But uh, yeah, Jack Ketchum's The Girl Next Door was one of the most horrible books I've ever read, but also in my top 20. So put that into perspective. I don't know how to, I can't even put my mind around it, but you <coughs> a girl named Excuse Meg. Me. And oh, uh, like, yeah, dude, I mean, I don't even know, man. Save me. <laughs> Save oh, me because. Well, I mean, man, I'm. I feel it is uh, I read that book, I think, two years coming out of high school. And this is when I was already into a lot of true crime podcasts. And if you guys want to hear my thoughts more about true crime, I did a chat with Spooky Noodles over at his channel. And that's one of the things we touched on. But I'm not going to get into that. But this book in particular, I remember watching the movie first. And it's easily uh, I did not know it was a true story when I saw it. So I was like, man, that is one of uh, one messed up exploitation flick. And I'm like, this is really uh, you know, one of the darkest coming of age stories I've read. And like it made me think, like, does this happen? And 
I was beyond disgusted and shocked to find how much stuff is actually on the case uh, that that the movie was inspired by. And then I found out about Jack Ketchum's book and I ended up reading it and I was like, uh, I feel this is, it's going to be weird to say this following up what you just said. I think it is a must read for everyone who, anyone who does not uh, believe that this world that that does not believe in bad luck so i think wouldn't you agree i think it is a must read for people who want to know what some people have to go through in life and just to know that appearances can appearances are probably the most deceiving thing ever and that's all i can say really that's all i will say uh it is not a book you're going to enjoy and that can be said about half the stuff that ketchum puts out yeah his, his writing you come for the writing and you either stay or leave for the story that's how i'll describe I, a ketchum book you know i was after i posted my review today for it um and I and I agree with your say, what, what you're saying. If, if you are a person who maybe lives your life a little more naive to the fact that there's monsters that can be next door, um, then definitely this is a book for you because it opens your eyes uh, or refreshes your eyes. I've always known that there's yeah. insane people, but it, it, it refreshes your mind that man, there's people out there that have it way worse than you. And uh, but yeah, if you, it's it's hilarious. It, it, this book is a poster child for a good book that is under a 4.0 on Goodreads. This is, don't, don't look at the reviews. It's, it's worth a read if you, if you have a strong stomach, but the amount of one to two star ratings for this book is, is honestly blasphemy because just because you DNF'd it because you couldn't handle it doesn't mean it's not a yeah, good story. And, and I don't, you I know? don't even want to get into that aspect of it uh, because it's, that actually sickens me to my stomach. You have these people and I'm not going to get too into this, but people who uh, clearly have read the premise of the book and you D- DNFing it, I think is a disrespect to not only uh, Jack Ketchum's attempt to, to, to depict what this girl went through for you, but it's a distress. It's disrespect to what the, to the girl too because what you're saying is you know uh i understand if people dnf it and don't rate it at all or give it a four or a five because they're saying this is exceptionally well written it's very well told i i just cannot read what this person went through that i is a hundred percent agree with that sentiment what i disagree with is you giving one star to someone thing that happened to someone's it's it happened exactly. to someone in real life unless you feel like no one should write about this kind of thing, which I also disagree with anyone who thinks that, but that's a personal cho- opinion, I guess. But yeah, yeah you guys uh, definitely take uh, Josh is not like saying this lightly. It's really, really uh, knowing now that, you know, it's a true story and you go into it, it's going to make things, everything you read a lot, much, a lot worse. And uh, also if you read one of his other books, I'm pretty sure it might be based on a true story. I'm not sure. It might not actually because of how crazy it is, but it's called The Woman. That is equally uh, equally messed up. The movie of that film adaptation of that is extremely well done. Absolutely one of the most horrifying things I've seen. So uh, if you want to read an author who is not afraid of showing you just here you go, how how messed up this world is on a platter and you want to, it, it to be well-written, then Jack Ketchum is your guy. If that absolutely. doesn't sound, if, if you even have doubts about whether you want to read it or not, absolutely do not read it. <laughs> yeah, that goes yeah. without saying. That is definitely yeah, yeah. the case. He is, that is not a joke. It was, and let it me, was let me, let me, let me ask, times. let me ask you something. Having read the book, do you think you'd ever want to check out the film adaptation? Not at all. Not a single okay. yeah. part of me want. Visually, I, it, visually, I, after I couldn't see it, I, I wouldn't be able to sit, sit through yeah. it. I, I honestly, I put the book down six, six times. I was like, can I, can I continue reading this? And I was like, you know what? It's, I kind of just, I, I respect the author because of what he, that's a bold story to write. It's a bold, he's got some cojones to, to sit down and be like, I'm going to write this girl's story because it needs to be told. And I respect the hell out of Jack Ketchum for that RIP. And yeah, so yeah. Oh yeah, no, dude. I don't and, think uh, I can watch. 
movie. So. Yeah, and exact, and I'd recommend someone if you're gonna start with one or the other. It's weird because on one hand, and you like someone who wants to check out the story for sure. If you go with the Ketchum version, you're gonna have to, uh, you're gonna have to force yourself to read prolonged passages of very messed up stuff. And you're gonna be with the book and the story for a while, obviously. If you check out the film version. It's only, you know, I think it's less than two hours. You can skip it if you want and just to get the story in. But uh, it they don't shy away from showing anything. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool, man. OK, so I guess I'll get that, into that. that got yeah, dark yeah. And deep. yeah, yeah, it got very, very <laughs> dark and deep. And I guess not, it is. And I guess the, the biggest thing that can be said as a compliment to Jack Ketchum is it's a it's the subject matter that you despise you'll never revisit it again and yet you had to include it in your top 20 it, it's it deserves it but it was you know what he nailed what he was going for that's all i gotta say that's all i gotta say good job jack catch him <laughs> yeah all right cool man my my number 18 is it's a ya novel <laughs> oh what a my, change up all yeah right. yeah okay so it's called The House of the Scorpion by Nancy Farmer. This is one of the ones because the synopsis is so short. I will read it to you because it'll just give you an example of, wow, this is why a just off the premise alone. The House of the Scorpion with undertones of vampires, Frankenstein, dragons, hordes and killing fields. Matt's story turns out to be an inspiring tale of friendship, survival, hope and transcendence. A much a must read for teenage fantasy fans. This is part horror, part thriller, part fantasy, part sci-fi. This is this is basically extremely well-written, age-appropriate bizarro for for people who are like in seventh grade and up, man. And if That's that doesn't cool. sound just you know what I mean, amazing to anyone, then I don't know what else to say. This book, I read it when I was in eighth grade and did a book report on it. The teacher had never heard of this book, and she ended up <laughs> reading the book next month and and told me, you know. <laughs> You, wow, you weren't wrong in your book report. Like this is this is one of the best books I've ever read, and it That's won uh, tons of prizes. It's phenomenal characters. It's very mature prose for a YA novel, and no, this is not a slight to YA, but it's just a fact. I think no one will disagree with the fact that prose is not something uh, usually that YA, you know, the YA industry focuses on that much. But no. yeah. Nancy Farmer knocks it out of the park. It's extremely well written. The atmosphere is terrifying absolutely terrifying i remember i remember being actually uh having to take breaks because of how morbid and just suffocating like just the opening chapters are and uh it's something that adults can enjoy as well it's extremely dark in a lot of places the themes include defining the characteristics of what makes us human you know, how we should be proud of our individual differences, isolation and tackling fear of the unknown. So I think the House of the Scorpion is is just a gem that never gets talked about. Every everyone should read it. And the only thing is, I remember the plot being very confusing. So I, I took a look on the good old Goodreads to see what people have to say about it. And surprisingly, it's still rated very well. P, the people who don't like it uh, slight it just based on that one aspect, the plot being very confusing and I think it is just that their expect expectations for a YA novel were a little different. And it is very dense literature for YA. So that is That's why it earns a place on this list. And I, I believe it's the only YA novel, excluding like, you know what I mean? Uh, Hatchet is not YA. That's much really for children, actually, which is yeah. what makes that more amazing. But yeah. Shout so, out to YA. Not abs- enough YA booktubers out here. Yeah, absolutely. Ab- ab- absolutely, man. Just I'll do I'll we'll do the <laughs> young adult worth reading section. I'm just kidding. There but, you uh, go. See, but, we can yeah, do a whole top ten on YA. I'm sure ab- we've read enough. Absolutely, man. Uh, and just props to Nancy Farmer. She's I've never yeah. read anything else by her, but I should check her out. This is this I actually book should check a, that one out. Absolutely, man. The House of the Scorpion by Nancy Farmer is my number 18. Cool. I keep taking notes. Every book you say, man, I'm over here noting. I don't Me know too, if you man. see it, but I'm taking notes. <laughs> uh, I'm like, I'm like adding parasite milk to my shopping cart right now. No, yeah, well, parasite milk yeah. is great. Uh, so next up is number 17 for me, and that's going to be Red Rising by Pierce Brown. Uh, 
I'll keep it kind of short. It's it's basically Hunger Games, but like the guy version. Um, and by that, I mean there's a male uh, main character. Not that it's, you know. But, uh, yeah, and, it, and it's awesome. Basically, you got kids killing kids, and uh, you have this gentleman who it's a class-based system, so there's different colors of people. Um, and so there's a red race, a yellow race, a blue race, a gray, you know. I might be getting the colors wrong, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah. So basically the red is the bottom, and then they have the gold, which is the top. The gold are the perfect people. And this guy's goal in the beginning of the book, this is the first chapter pretty much, is to uh, infiltrate the golds and basically uh, try to make his people not oppressed anymore. So it's really fast-paced sci-fi, and it reads easy it reads there's not a lot of high crazy science there's a little bit of political intrigue which i like in my science fiction because it's all nonsense and not real life um and it's just great it's it's great sci-fi and if you are interested in trying sci-fi along with blake crouch um pierce brown's novels are really easily accessible and uh they're a great read so awesome what was the title again sorry that's Red Rising by Pierce oh, Brown. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, I, yeah. I, now I, I the t- it clicked with me. I saw it a lot on your Goodreads at first. During you know, I followed your updates. You weren't sure exactly how how you were what you were like what yeah. kind of score you're going to go with, but I mean now what a what a twist! It's on your top twenty. So that premise yeah. alone sounds epic. It, so I def- the reason definitely why sounds it's... like my kind of sci-fi, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and honestly, it is. Um, the reason why, the more it sat with me, um, and this might be a case of I started the next book and the first couple chapters fixed the one problem I had in the first book, which was um, less of a setting. You almost were dropped into this and not, you, you didn't, uh, it was more character driven and not uh, plot and setting driven which with sci-fi and fantasy you tend to want to go setting um and plot as opposed to like heavy heavy characters which is nowadays they are doing that more but um back in the day with classic fantasy and sci-fi which is what i kind of grew up reading was um they're more setting politics deep science and things like that. So I was kind of looking for that when I picked it up and that's wrong. Don't go into that wanting that. It's more of a newer age um, sci-fi thriller is what I would say. It's more of a sci-fi thriller, not traditional classical sci-fi. So yeah. So the more it sat with me, it grew on me. It was like a, you know, one of those things. So dude, dude, it's awesome. And, and I guess one thing we forgot to mention, and you bring up a good point is this is something you read recently. This list obviously will change for us. I think every two to three years, cause we read so much that it, it's bound to, we're about bound to find exactly. the next great thing. So, but that dude, that sounds awesome. And like, yeah, it, I'm glad, like, it's so cool. Like discovering a new author, right. That you just like vibe with really well. Oh yeah. Yeah. I went right out. I was like, I was finishing up the last couple chapters of Red Rising, and I was like, I got to see what happens next. And I love that feeling. And I was like, wife, we have to go to Barnes & Noble tomorrow (laughs) because I need to get it, and I can't wait for Amazon to drop it off. So we got to do it. And at that time, all the local bookstores, shout out to those people, were still closed. So hopefully they can open back up soon. But yeah, Yeah, dude, I miss shopping for books in person. I need to go do that sometime. (laughs) I am. Um, it's great. Even, even with the mask, it's great. So yeah, it's fun. So. Exactly. Awesome, dude. Well, I guess, so you were, sounds like more of a sci-fi and fantasy kid, right? In oh terms yeah. Of like what you got into. Yeah. I was more of, I think not horror until like I said, like goosebumps and stuff, but, uh, this was kind of like when I was into my horror phase, which I guess why it's, it's, it's easily my favorite Sherlock Holmes novel. It's The Hound of the Baskervilles by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This book is absolutely fantastic. If you guys want to know what brilliant, just brilliant storytelling, brilliant writing, iconic characters, all this, just how well everything reads together, check out The Hound of the Baskervilles. It's definitely his creepiest, easily this dude's creepiest story involving Sherlock Holmes of all time. The atmosphere he creates surrounding this 
this really messed up legend about this murderous hound is just amazing and it totally freaked me out as a kid i used to read this book at night i remember it took me about like a week to get through just because of how creeped out i'd get and i get i got a nightmare one time i remembered and it it's not like straight up horror i'm not gonna like mismarket it but i also don't want to spoil it the characters you know the red herrings in the book are all very well done it's uh it's what can i say it's just a classic mystery novel and I don't read any more of those these days, and I, I don't think they're that popular anymore. And I think part of the reason is just, you know, Conan Doyle just buried the whole genre with this stuff because it's so it's so epic, man. It's so good. And this easily is the most fun I've had. Uh, it's the most fun I've had reading one of his books. Usually they're much more dense and heady and reserved for like an adult audience just because of how mature everything is the pros and everything but this and this was the un, uh, the unabridged version i read it was a ton of fun and i enjoyed it i learned a lot of new words <laughs> and it was it's just uh i oh, think yeah, it's, that's always it, fun <laughs> yeah dude it's it's a it's a masterpiece and uh, i think it, it's it's something's to be said about just being the author to create one of the most iconic characters in all of literature so i had to include it in my top 20 so oh, yeah absolutely. it's um yeah so that's pretty much it for that one and uh I, I i i read this as an eighth grader and it was a little too young i think in terms of like the brain power required to process the unabridged version but it is a totally uh worth checking out for anyone who hasn't and just to get a taste of what old school well done mystery is and it doesn't yeah, feel it yeah it's not this isn't a slight to uh, agatha christie because she's cool too but this does not feel this is much more so in the literary realm and it's very cool. very just uh it's in it's a masterpiece in my opinion as as a mystery awesome. novel so that the hound of the baskervilles i'm gonna check that out yeah <laughs> sounds good to me awesome uh we're, we're on 16 correct yep yes yeah, all right so that one is going to be Recursion by Blake Crouch. Um, he has made an appearance in the, uh, you know, in uh, Scion's mentions list. And, oh, absolutely, uh, yeah. man. And, and like, like I said, it, was, it would have been in the top five if I finished it before this video. Exactly. So what you're going to do is once you finish Dark Matter, give it a little bit. And then you got to try recursion. Uh, it does get knocked by, uh, I've seen other booktubers and like reviewers, hardcore reviewers that have read his other stuff. It is um, based on the way that it reads. I disagreed. I loved it. I had fun because I like his style. I just like Blake Crouch's style. So if you read Dark Matter, um, you're going to love it. But basically recursion is, is it, it deals with the man. Mandela, um, and basically people, there's science involved where they create some machine and people's, um, they start having false memories. So wow. there's, it's really cool. It's really cool. I don't want to spoil anything because his stories are so twisty, turny and like thriller, just really, um, just gritty. And, but there was a scene in this that, uh, yeah, there, I don't even want to spoil anything, man. Blake Crouch, if you enjoy his work, try this one out. I do have to say, based on the pacing and the fact that it's similarly structured as a story, it does come off repetitive if you read it right after Dark Matter, if that makes sense. Uh, okay, I mean, but that, I I guess we're, I'm, not, I'm only halfway through Dark Matter, but I guess yeah. I don't want to spoil it for anyone. We need to yeah. talk about it <laughs> separately. Yeah, we'll talk but, about it after. Yeah, yeah but uh, uh I could understand what you mean by like what happens in dark matter and just based on the premise premise of this machine that creates false memories. So like, but that already sounds awesome to me. And like, yeah, I'm, see, you know I'm, exactly what I'm talking about without us spoiling it. Dude, uh, I'm a slave to, I'm a total slave when it comes to grounding, grounded sci-fi plots like that. And knowing how he writes, it is all you've sold me just by saying Blake yeah. Crouch and false memory. So I'm like, I'm in. Yeah, exactly. Because it's not overly scientific. He just writes, he, he has an idea of where he wants with like using it in a horrific manner. Like this science was created and now what is mankind going to do with it? It's probably not going to go well. And that's, that's kind of how Blake Crouch writes basically. So yeah. So, all right. Yeah, dude, awesome. Like, dude, he's like, 
I will say this, because even though I didn't include him in the top 20, I have no problem saying he's in my top five favorite authors of all time. Not even having finished one of his books. it's He's yeah. that good, guys. Jeff, definitely, he's a must-buy. Must-buy for uh, me. Yeah, exactly. I can't imagine giving any any of his books less than three stars, even if the story was horrible, just based on the how someone can come up with such like a dense plot. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, it's 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 very smart. I I, I honestly I'm like I try to find other authors that may even touch the type of storylines that he does, and it's impossible. I just need him to drop another book because I enjoy it so much. <laughs> so. Awesome, dude. Okay, cool. So so my number sixteen. This is a very uh, interesting uh, because it's a very interesting story of how I found out about this book. I'll read you the the brief synopsis from Goodreads first, so everyone gets a taste of what it's about. A child seeking to avenge the wrongs perpetrated on his parents, Young Soo Park's genius, born into the turmoil of post-war Korea, is used as a puppet by the South Korean government before being banished to America. From a remote New York City ghetto, the boy wages a clandestine guerrilla war against all symbols of authority. Park renders his vision of late 20th century global culture with the bold, surreal strokes of Pynchon, that is Thomas Pynchon, and the wild political sensibilities of Goddard. The painful, wow. largely unmapped narrative territory of boy genius creates a gripping, harrowing read. Now, that sounds epic and awesome and so unique. The reason I read it I went to an after-school program when I was <laughs> 10 years old. The director of the program was fa- friends with this author, who is also a filmmaker now, I found out, who lives in New York City. He, he introduced me to the guy just because he was chilling in class. So the director introduced me to this author. I was 10 years old. I didn't even know. I was like, what's up? It's awesome. <laughs> this dude, having heard what the book is about, this dude gifted me a copy of his book. <laughs> As a 10-year-old, <laughs> dude. And I, the, the cover is this small little kid holding him an AK like this. And it's car- it's badass. like animated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, needless to say, I read two pages, uh, like the first chapter, and I just put it down when I was 10. I'm like, I, I don't know what this is. So it's, uh, it's, I was like, cool, though. The cover is cool, <laughs> you know. But I read it again when I was 15 in high school and was instantly blown away completely. I, this is the first book I read that it was very adult the language is extremely hoarse it is uh very dense like you just heard and there's really real like uh young Soo park ex- uh, explores uh you know themes of just rebellion society culture and especially how youth is viewed by the general public in in r- really severe detail and i loved every page I remember reading this in high school and I was like, I, I felt like I had a treasure forever because it's such a unique way. You know, this book was, I was great for this book. It's such a cool way, dude. And I was like, man, wow. Like talk I'm about so authors having cojones. And, that and was... now, yeah, dude. And I'm sure this author is going to be a grateful because hopefully he's never going to listen to this obviously somehow, but I guess if his name is tagged in the, or in the timestamps, but Dude, you're an amazing uh, writer. This dude, no one even bear. He has two followers on Goodreads, which just goes to show you, like, yeah, it's kind of sad, but everyone needs to check this guy out, man. Young Sue Park, boy genius. Go, 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 pick up this book if you want just a really dark, entertaining, ballsy coming of really messed up coming of age story. Yeah, boy that's, genius. That's boy awesome. Support. Yeah, dude. That's okay, cool. Story. That was my number sixteen. Nice. Yeah. So uh, number 15 for me is uh, going to be Tuesdays with Maury. Um, this is also kind of a high school story for me. Uh, I, I read it. It was the perfect time for a story. Sometimes when you pick up a book and uh, you, you just you, you actually get into it and you're like, what the heck, man? This is like speaking to me. And that's why it's it's always going to have a special place for me. Um, I just, I had just recently lost some people that were important to me in my life and, uh, yeah, Tuesdays with Maury, man, you, you know, I can't, I, I can't even remember really like anything about the story. I just remember how much it hit me. And it's just one of those books that sticks in my head that I'm like, yeah, Mitch albums, Tuesdays with Maury, uh, as a mainstream book that people read in high school, uh, definitely is a classic for me. So. Yeah, you just deal with loss and um, 
just how to to how to have it how to handle it and really the writing was because i've heard of it so much man i've never read it do you mind telling me like really briefly what it's about or would it spoil no i'll i'll just read the synopsis um dude it's been so long it's the first thing when you type two into uh goodreads it's the first thing that comes up so uh yeah maybe it was a grandparent or a teacher or a colleague someone older patient and wise who understood you when you were young and searching and gave you sound advice to help you make your way through it for mitch album that person was maury schwartz schwartz his college professor from nearly 20 years ago now it's coming back to me uh maybe like mitch you lost track of that mentor as you made your way and the insights faded wouldn't you like to see that person again ask the bigger questions that still haunt you so yeah so basically i can finish that uh basically yes it's it's a real story about a a college professor that mitch album had who was a sports writer mitch album um yeah and then he decided to write this book about his college professor that um really made an impact on him in college that was a really good role model for for mitch album and then as his teacher was getting older and as we get older we usually pass away that's how human beings work and uh so he reconnected with him and kind of was able to give his high school professor tell him basically how much of an impact he made on his life and uh yeah it's just there's no hiding it says right in the story uh right in the synopsis basically it's it's a it's a story about life as a whole and if you haven't read tuesdays with maury um it's worth reading it'll make you cry just dude i um, i'm definitely gonna read it because what you just said like the premise i'm not gonna lie i was kind of holding back uh tears because i i that that's premise alone what a thing to write like uh, as a as a student of someone you look up to and respect, like, wow, that sounds really like deep and powerful. It's like, hard for me to even talk and, about and this intimate. one. <laughs> yeah, dude. Cause I, and I'll give him a shout out right here, I guess. Funny enough. He is a, uh, he's a mystery and thriller author. It's he's the only professor I'll ever remember from my time at, uh, at NYIT. Uh, and I didn't graduate from there. I left about after about two and a half years, but I took uh, English to research writing there, and I found uh, the professor's name was John Misak. You guys can check him out on Amazon. He writes the Keegan Detective series. He was the only professor up to that point who who told me I, I wasn't a bad student just because I didn't care about most subjects. I did very well in that class. He said he told me never stop writing, and I never did, and I'm glad I listened to him. So... He doesn't have a big audience, but he writes several novels and stuff on Amazon. So definitely, I just wanted to give him a shout out because yeah, man, I got awesome. I got I got to check out that book, man. Yeah, it it'll it'll hit you, it'll hit you because he tackles all that stuff, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, it literally on the front, an old man, a young man, and life's greatest lesson. So yeah, Mitch Album did a good job with that one. So that was my number fifteen selection. Awesome, dude, amazing. Yeah, I I mean it's just. That's really when you when we recall right what writing is supposed to be about is just when you totally connect with words on a page. Words on a page can move you like that, man. That's that's the biggest compliment I think. And obviously it's something not seen in like it's not a slight, it's just not part of the horror genre, thriller genre. But when you read something that's supposed to speak to you that way and it does, that's like magic basically. Oh yeah, it was, and it's very short. I think it's only it's very short. It's like 150 pages. So. It, that's literally like you said that's what the goal is when you read it so yeah awesome book amazing dude awesome cool okay cool my number 15 <laughs> again transitioning from very deep subject matter my number 15 is one of the most underrated fun really well-conceived suspenseful slow burn thriller novels of all time in my opinion it's by an author who's frequently just made fun of uh, disrespected and maybe rightfully so for some of his content not disrespected and made fun of but like just people don't enjoy him that much but you might be able to guess who i'm talking about it's night in the lonesome october by richard layman 
that's my number fi- number 15, man. Night in the Lonesome October. I read this one about three months ago, and it was my uh, second experience with Layman. The first one was very much so more a horror one. It was a book called Savage, which is an awesome, dark adventure story having to do with Jack the Ripper. And it's yeah, so absolutely. well conceived, man. Yeah, I definitely highly recommend that one, but it's, it's not on the list or anything, uh, or even in the honorable mentions. Night in the Lonesome October. If if you are if you were ever a kid or like a high schooler, so older kid or a high schooler who frequently just likes spending time on your own at night, especially, you will love this book. Nothing brutal happens for most of the story, and even when it does happen. I don't want to spoil anything. It's just, it's one of the stories where you're not sure about anything as you're reading the whole thing. And usually that's like, you know, subtlety and suspense is not layman's, what layman is known for. Let's be honest, right? He's known yeah. for just being the, one of the founding fathers of like the splatter genre. But this story is just, a, it's a truly terrifying, unpredictable and suspenseful reading experience all the characters in this novel that's this is something richard layman never gets credit for the dialogue is so funny in in this it is very non-pc i'm warning you guys so and think of it written a while ago the dialogue in this is so witty it's sharp it's hilarious and it's brutally honest and just makes you feel like you're going to school with these guys it's so well (laughs) done dude that's Uh, awesome he doesn't shy away from detailing any vulgar or crass thoughts Things that seem tame or unimportant to the story all of a sudden becomes become horrifying in the in when you least expect it. So and oftentimes this is considered to be his best novel by many people right behind the traveling vampire show, which I've never read. But you, if you guys want a really fun, a really entertaining, funny, well paced suspenseful thriller, you guys got to check out Night in the Lonesome October by Richard. That's Williams. awesome. That's my number 15. I got to read that one, too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So number 14 for me is uh, The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. Now, this is the first in his King Killer Chronicles series, which also is followed up by The Wise Man's Fear. This is the one that kind of started it for me with him. His prose is there's a reason it took seven years to write. Uh, <laughs> he shows that it take, took seven years to write. Um, and that's honestly, when I get into fantasy, that's what I really like to see is, uh, those authors that just put in that time with, uh, their prose. So y- you follow a Kavoth and the cool part about this story is that it is him in, as a retired person, basically, he just works at a bar and there is a person called the chronicler and he came to his bar basically to write his life story. So Kavoth wow. is telling this guy who's going to write a story about him yeah. what happened years ago. So it's written that type of way, and it and and it's super neat. It's very cool. You go to like a school. It's kind of like Hogwarts, but a little bit more, way cooler in my opinion. No <laughs> cool, offense to yeah. Harry Potter, but like you know, there's it's more more action. So, uh, but I'd say big knock for me. The more it sits on me is the main characters. Um, got a lot of teenage angst and it comes off like, you know, just like you're kind of screaming at the page, like, dude, just like kiss the girl already. You know what I mean? Like things like that. Uh, so it's interesting. It's a good book, but, uh, yeah, if you haven't checked out Patrick Rothfuss, uh, don't do it and, uh, wait until he releases the third book. That's what I would suggest. (laughs) Dude, (laughs) he's a a great guy, but don't do it to yourself because you're going to be waiting you might it, it it's honestly he doesn't know if he's ever going to be able to finish it he doesn't know how to so that's what he said he, he, is, funny, he actually this, said that <laughs> so yeah based on like what the premise been it sounds like something i normally wouldn't go out of my way to read but the fact that it's cool that you're putting it on your top 20 and recommending it to me i absolutely yeah. will check it out because i trust your taste when it comes to this kind of uh this kind yeah. of genre but awesome you just man. might want to put great, it on the know. back burn for a while in my opinion you know it's just wait and see yep. if it finishes because if not you're left in a cliffhanger for okay, seven yeah years. yeah don't want that so <laughs> yeah that that Very reminds cool. me of it's totally unrelated genre it reminds me of the the creator of this really dark uh uh manga called berserk and he, he's notorious for just 
creating amazing stuff, but he's never finished the series yet, I think. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's exactly that's exactly it. So yeah. <laughs> that was my number 14. For it. Awesome, dude. Cool. Okay. My number 14 is a guy that everyone needs to check out more. He's with one of the biggest bizarre horror, bizarre and hardcore horror publishing houses in our community, but people just don't talk about him, I see. John Wayne Communale Scummer. That is my number 14. It is easily one of the best books I've ever read in my life. It is, it's about a filthy barfly who basically, he lives off leftovers. Uh, he drinks people's stuff when they're not looking. Uh, he's in the bathroom constantly. And this, this is all relevant, which is why I'm mentioning it. And it's about an outsider who becomes infatuated with how free this guy is with being so vile and disgusting. And it is a disgusting and extremely well-told, unpredictable story. John Wayne Communale's uh, literary voice, dude, it is so confident. It is so unique and confident when he writes. I love the way he writes. Uh, it sounds like it sounds like he's just had it, in, a, in a, but he still wants to... It's like he's showing off, but being very laid back at the same time. It's very actually literary. Uh, and I say surprisingly because it's coming out of Grindhouse Press, where I know you have people like Samantha Kolesnik, but but it, it still shocked me for sure, especially when you don't see a literary voice with paired with such depraved subject matter. And awesome. it's just it has a rebellious attitude throughout the whole thing. And to me, this was a twisted celebration of embracing rock bottom, basically. That's what it is. It's about smiling at how average your life seems and learning to strip away judgment from everyone and everything. And obviously, this is not a guide to live through a life in the best way possible. But when you're feeling really down, that's when I feel you should check out this book because it will hit you the hardest. And it's when I checked it out. And yes. the characters in this book, man, are, are repulsive. But because of how repulsive they are, and he writes them in a way that he makes it sound like you know people like this, even though you really won't, just because of the level of depravity that these people engage in. They draw you in completely, and it's totally nihilistic, and it has fun with that. It's totally unapologetic. And most of all, being a Grindhouse Press book, I have to give it kudos for having two scenes that are so outlandishly messed up i'm warning you guys right now if you get through the first few pages of this you might feel you can continue on because the first few pages right off the bat are disgusting beyond belief <laughs> you you have no clue what's in store the middle has one of the the most disgusting thing i've ever read by far and it's very well written though it's imaginative it's beautiful i'll never forget oh. it and and the ending is extremely uh extremely messed up and depraved as well but yeah this book reminds you uh it just reminds you to laugh at how much life sucks once in a while so that's why i recommend scummer by john wayne come you know i gotta try him i, I did recently pick up one of his now uh no novellas so i definitely need to check him out and he seems yeah. like a super chill guy too oh so, yeah dude. super talented hard working awesome yeah yeah, like he's got a podcast on here too that is worth checking out. Well, it's like him and his buddy just putting up YouTube videos, and they only have like 22 subs. So definitely check out him. I, I, I if, will, man, yeah. absolutely. So uh, number 13 for me is going to be a recent read. Also, uh, it's the Halloween Tree by Ray Bradbury. Um, I see a lot of up and down reviews for this one. Me as a fantasy fan, this hit me a little differently because it was kind of a little bit of both. It, it kind of made me feel like it was Halloween night and child, like I was a child and that uh, you, you just really follow this group of friends and it tackles um, a little bit of deeper things in life that children don't fully understand. And I think I seen kind of what Ray Bradbury was going for a little bit with that one and I enjoyed it. And also just just the adventure of it. It's, it's really a fun, uh, peaceful read. And and I can't wait to like read it to my child someday. Um, it's 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 just timeless, I think. And and really, Ray Bradbury, I need to read more of him because, uh, yeah, he's just he's he's really good. And I think, uh, yeah, 
It goes without saying, Ray Bradbury. I mean, what else can you say? Yeah, it's a crime I haven't checked it out, man, because now it's in your top 20. I hear about it all the time. I just love anything, dude. October's coming up. I'm going to check it out because anything that reminds me of I, – I, it's been a while since I've checked out a book that reminded me of how fun and happy Halloween's supposed to be. So I think that'll be the perfect book for that, And right? this one is honestly it because you just you're, – you're in the group of boys – it just puts you back at like Halloween where you're running down the street and you got your, your sack of candy and you're just, you're ready for Halloween, you know? And, uh, these kids basically, they just get this adventure that they really weren't bargained for. That wasn't the plan when they left the house that day, but it was a lot of fun. You just, you got to read it for yourself. I don't want to spoil anything because of the fact it's not very long. And, uh, I actually listened to the audio book for it and that might've also added to my enjoyment level. It might be a better audio book than, uh, cause it's very theatrical with the events that happen. It's very, very fantastical and just, there's a lot of stuff going on. So it was definitely a great audio book to read. So that was my number 13 I mean, selection, Ray Bradbury's The Halloween Tree. Awesome. I have another question for you uh, on that. Have you read, I have not read any Bradbury. So have you read any of his other stuff? I have not read like the ones that everybody knows about, like Fahrenheit 451. I haven't read. Okay. Um, I've read a couple short stories of his, and then I read The Zen and the Art of Writing, which is his writing story. And oh, there you, is, you did read that. I saw that recently. Yeah. Yeah, there is some tips in there that uh, I mean, it's not it's not a top twenty fiction read, but if <laughs> yeah. you're an author, if we were going to have an author. Uh, top five nonfiction books you should read yeah. is Zen in the Art of Writing by Ray Bradbury is up there because of the fact that he gives you some tips that he did that I've never heard other authors do. Like I've never heard of, like he would have a list and he would get a notebook and he would write on each page, a title of a, whatever, a story that he wants to write. It would just be the tree. And then he would write the Halloween tree based on it. Who does that? I don't even know how that works, but he said it as it gives you a writing prompt without even trying. So that's I feel like just because he's so talented. Yeah, I think that's that the part. <laughs> I think you missed that part, Bradbury. It's like, yeah. you know, just, yeah. just sit down and like write about this thing and make, really, a, and make a classic it, book about it. It's not it's that, that's, just 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 try that. <laughs> that's what it was there was a whole passage on it and i'm like sitting there and i'm like you know what i mean i guess that works if you're ray bradbury but for most layman uh you know average people like you know <laughs> sounds like the most most insightful least helpful book you can read <laughs> exactly so take that with a grain of salt but the parts that i really enjoyed were when the more uplifting like hey you can do this you know okay. uh ray brad you know he's like i made a career out of writing hundreds of short stories when you think about it he wrote the martian chronicles is short stories you know so and october october country is another short story collection i think yeah exactly so he says in that he's like you don't have to be a novelist in the traditional sense you can write hundreds of stories and make a living which hey, i thought man, was i know for like you and me man we talk all the time like dude if i could release a novella in my lifetime i'll be happy and i have so much fun writing short stories they take a while for me to write i'm a very slow writer but yeah hearing someone like bradbury uh just you know reinforce that belief that you're not a fake writer if you don't write novels it's a very comforting thing to hear coming from one of the yeah. best writers of all time but yeah yep okay so my number 13 is a novel that was a novella i should say that was released recently it's by none other than edward lord everyone in this community knows who he is uh and the novella is south of here although this has a like a really high rating on goodreads the reviews sing a different tune when i looked into them people really had a problem with the subject matter he chose to explore in this one it's basically about a man who goes to visit his father after a long time who was a pedophile and his father lives in a park filled with other pedophiles and they hold meetings talking about their feelings how it's like to be uh, like you know what i mean just apart from society right there it's very very messed up subject matter and he holds nothing back i'm just going to state that so if just based that on 
that alone doesn't sound like something you'd be comfortable reading, don't check it out. I think the way he goes about talking about the things he does in this book is extremely well done. It is easily one of the most well-written pieces of fiction I've ever read. It is, it is very, very honest. There's not a character in this book that did not feel like a real person. I'm talking about the person at the gas station working. It is so well done. It is Edward Lorne. I've only read the only other book I've read by him is Life After Dane, and that was a masterpiece too, in my opinion. It's not good enough. It wasn't just. It wasn't. I didn't love it enough to put it in my top twenty, but I'd easily say it is one of the best serial killers novels I've ever read in my life. And this wasn't horror at all. It is absolutely horrifying the subject matter, but this is going to sound like some pretenders bullshit, but it truly is the best way I can describe it. It's it's a very somber and courageously written meditation on what being a broken person means. That's that's what this is about. And yes. if you want to read a slice of life story that I don't think very few authors will cover this subject matter. So you might as well go with an author who's a very good storyteller. And I feel you'll either be totally... Uh, taken aback in the first few pages of just who the main the main protagonist of the the story is the best person you'll read about so and you'll know how messed up it is me saying that when you start to read it but uh i am just happy this book exists because i i feel this is subject matter that's very fascinating to read about it's not enjoyable in the slightest but it's so well uh well fleshed out for a novella i uh, it's rare to find character work this this good in a novella and he really did did a great job with this man so i definitely feel south of here just based on it being a novella the characters and how how well he tr was able to traverse the subject matter without it seeing exploitative uh or exploitative. I never know how to pronounce that word, but South of no, Here I by Ed, yes. yeah, South of Here by Edward Lornman, number thirteen, easy, uh, easy pick right there. And uh, yeah, cool. It makes sense that he would write something like that because of uh, I follow E for a long time, and I knew when uh, he was a Jack Ketchum fan, and yeah. um, he did when Jack Ketchum passed, he, he really did a heartfelt. Thing. It was like maybe two, three years ago about yeah. it. And I know that his type of uh, fiction that he really enjoys is that the things that authors taking a risk. So that actually is pretty that's cool that he wrote that one. I, I remember when he was working on that. So that's that sounds good. I've read like uh, the life of Dane and Bay's End by him. And yeah, he's he's a great storyteller, like you said, and a great author. So, yeah, uh, yeah. Number 12 cool. for yeah. me is the Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins. So shout out to the YA booktubers out there. Awesome, yeah. Try to keep your excitement down, but I agree. That, that book is great. I don't know if it deserves 37 videos on my channel, but it is a great book because of when it hit for me. I was younger and it was a good little YA piece of fiction. Kids killing kids, you know, can't go wrong there. So like I said, with Red Rising, but uh, yeah, Hunger Games, because it kind of started a little trend there in fiction for a while, I feel. Awesome. Like a, lo a lot of people were trying to chase her coattails and write a similar Katniss Everdeen story. Um, like you yeah, had the Divergent series and all that. So I thought it was cool, a little dystopian, um, darker fiction. So The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins. Awesome, man. I, I need to revisit that book because when I read it, I absolutely hated it for one reason. I read this book called Battle Royale beforehand, and yeah. it's hands down one of the, the best, the best stories uh, involved, brutal, fun, entertaining stories involving uh, <laughs> kids, basically. And it, it really set the bar too high for me. And I had read it, Hunger Games, right after that. So it really, and already, like I said, I'm not a huge sci-fi, like, you know, dystopian yeah, yeah. fan. So well, I was like, this is not yeah. for me. She's a great writer for sure. That's 100% undoubtable. You know, no, no one can uh, dispute that fact. The I just read it. The timing was wrong for me. So I definitely will. I will check out The Hunger Games eventually because I think 
any author who can create create you know what i mean like i have so much respect for fantasy sci-fi authors they take so much time to flesh out their characters and story that it's definitely worth a second chance so i'll definitely Absolutely. check that out yeah okay so my my number 12 is another recent read one i know that i've hyped up to you like to no end and i know uh kevin from wellward beard loved it uh he gave it a four which means he pretty much had a blast with it it's it's easily my number 12. It's Perpetual Dread by Brian Boyer. So this book, man, it's so rare these days to see a work in the horror genre be handled with such a mean spirit and grim attitude. Uh, I'm not talking about like catch him at catch him levels of uh, torture or anything like that. Not that he created that stuff, but you know what I mean. Brian, what makes this book so good is it reminds you of why we love what the meanest parts about horror what horror really is supposed to mean this is a collection of totally bleak tales that revel in the most sadis sadistic aspects of humanity man like every everything from the characters to like the prose has no soul the soul is just completely gone from page one and it reminds you basically boyer just does his best to remind you of the sheer amount of suffering this world has the potential to inflict through each and every story. And the he doesn't hold your hand at all. It is, the way it's written, it's kind of like, at first it might seem like uh, it's too no frills, the prose, because it's like, it's not, it's not like, you might say this is not well written, but once you get one or two stories in, you're like, this fits perfectly. This is super messed up. And it's kind of like, it. yeah, dude, it's just like, it, it's if you guys are into extreme horror, but you want an extreme horror book that's written very uniquely and really, really makes you disturbed to your very core, highly recommend Perpetual Dread. My favorite stories were Terminal, Death Valley, Family Chapel, Gift and a Curse, Drago's Crib, Teacher's Pet, Scorpio, and Like Father, Like Son. So that that's my number 12th. I like that. I like that. Yeah, I got to try him out because I did see Well-Read Beard's review, and uh, I definitely got to try that one out. I have already written that one down, so that'll be on yeah, the radar yeah. for sure. Yeah. But uh, number 11 for me is actually another more uh, literary, more prose-driven fantasy story, and it was one of the first ones I picked up a long time ago, and that is The Dragon Bone Chair by Tad Williams. Tad Williams does not get enough respect in the fantasy fantasy community. Um, I wish people like Daniel Green and things like that would talk more about him. Uh, he deserves a lot of respect. He, he's well respected by other authors, but not nearly enough people read his books. I think it's because he's more classical. It's definitely not your type of your cup of tea. I will be honest with you, Sion, okay, you cool. would not enjoy it, but it's more of like that uh, chosen one trope, um, <laughs> more of a journey, okay, a little cool. bit Lord of the Rings-ish. Um, and, but yeah, if you enjoy like the Lord of the Rings or, um, not, uh, not a Game of Thrones, but like pretty much the anti Game of Thrones, there's not a lot of drama, not, not any like, uh, you know, the more of the, yeah, yeah. Like Wheel of Time, that classical fantasy is what I'll say. Definitely. So, I, yeah. I, and again, my hats go off my full respect to that kind of stuff. It's just way too large in scope for something I'll ever tackle. I know. Oh yeah, no, it's yeah. it's huge. But the Dragon Bone Chair by Tad Williams. Tad awesome. Williams also has some sci-fi series, and he's just an outstanding author. And I wish more people were like, hey, yeah, Tad Williams. Also, I'd like to take this moment. Uh, Terry Goodkind passed away today. Uh, who is it? He's along the same wow, lines. Wow, really? Yeah, I, I've heard yeah. of uh, Terry Goodkind. Yeah. Yeah, Terry Goodkind. Uh, you know, all all things aside, he get he gets some backlash on BookTube. Um, but it, honestly, I think he meant good by that. Uh what he was trying to say probably was that he never saw himself only writing one genre for his lifetime, but he was so successful at it. Um, and shout out to him. He, he made a lot of people happy with his stories. So I did want to say that at some point tonight. Uh, uh, yeah. I will always have respect for him. And it, it, this goes back to even people like uh, not comparing them at all, but like Edward Lauren, who you might not, you know, agree with everything they say, but the fact that someone can be so open and so strong 
with their convictions will always earn a, a place of respect in my book. And especially someone like Terry Goodkind, who who liked what he liked. He talked about what he liked and what he didn't like. He was very open about it. And I'm like, man, I, I like this guy because, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, he might not. Be, I might not be friends with him, but I definitely uh, it makes me want to check out his work for sure. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I own I own a few of the wizard, you know, the, the his series and um yeah, I haven't I haven't picked them up yet. They're pretty dense, but uh, I, I know that they're well well loved and well respected. So uh, yeah, R.I.P. Okay, so my number eleven is Gristle and Bone by Duncan Ralston. Everyone in this community know is familiar with Duncan Ralston. He's an awesome dude. Again, very he has strong convictions, and I love that about him. I'm good friends with him on Twitter. Uh, and this was my first time checking his workout and easily instantly as I was reading, I was like, man, this is almost top 10 for me. Hands down, best books I've ever read. It's number 11, Gristle and Bone. Right off the bat, Jack Ketchum praised the collection. So if that doesn't tell you something. <laughs> so I can't even imagine that. <laughs> I getting How much of a that. compliment, man? Yeah, that would be. So, <laughs> and and it's actually not extreme in nature. These are phenomenal, very deep, layered grounded horror stories some are cosmic but most of them are very very uh they're based in our deepest human fears and like just it a lot uh, it reminds me of brian uh, brian boyer's collection except ralston's prose is magnificent it is it is ridiculously good it's it's uh it actually reminds me of his writing reminds you of people like Stephen King and Corbett and McCarthy put together. Like it's that, that good. It's not the, the, the prose is not overly poetic, but it's still kind of literary and it makes the story flow really well. And each story is jam packed with great character development. There is an anxiety inducing tone throughout the whole collection. And my favorite tales were in order artifact number 37, beware of the dog fat of the lamb, baby teeth, and scavengers so absolutely check out that collection gristle and oh Bones. yeah i love duncan ralston's work man i've i've read uh a couple things by him i, I enjoyed ghostland um and uh yeah i just liked it he seems like a student of classic horror a little bit um it seems like oh, yeah. he likes that you know, he, that story you beware of that. the that story beware, beware of the dog totally felt like it belonged in a it, like king wrote it i'm not even joking in the best exactly. way possible Possibly. Yeah, no, I, I kind of pick up on that with, with his writing. Like, he's definitely a student of that. So, yeah, awesome. Cool, man. And Can't now, okay, so awesome. we're going to move into our top 10 now, guys. We're not going to spend as much time on each of these just because I feel they're so – these stories are not only well-loved by most people, they're they're so just beautifully told that I feel the more blind you go in, the better it will be. So we're going to kind of – uh, move this along a little. Okay, so you start yeah. with uh, number 10, man. Awesome. So number 10 is going to be The Silence by Tim Laban. Uh, Tim Laban's writing is very easy to, to, to read. And honestly, this one was just super cool because um, you get that sense of dread when they let out these monsters in the beginning of the book. And you just follow this little family and there's uh, just tons of action, man. It's such a fast paced read good horror and i like tim laban so can't go wrong there awesome man and yeah you loved it enough to put it in the top 10 so that uh, i'm definitely going to check that out yeah yeah they do a okay. pretty cool netflix movie also for it it was a pretty good adaptation oh okay cool okay i'll definitely check it out i didn't check out that movie just because i had seen the Qu a quiet place and it reminded me of that but i'll so i'll actually skip the movie and just check out the the novel yeah, I actually found the silence because I liked the Quiet Place so much. I re I looked up books that would be similar, and the silence is very similar. So yeah, that was awesome, my number man. ten. Okay, my number ten. It's gonna make a lot of people happy. Uh, it's Stephen King's Salem's Lot. This is these these vampires are doing what vampires were meant to do, and that scare that that scare the hell out of you and just prey on people. So this is uh. <laughs> one of the few Stephen King novels I finished. And this was instantly in my, one of the best books I've ever read, finished it in one day. And it's a pretty thick book. I could not stop reading it. Uh, it's hands down has some of the best dialogue I've ever read. Every character in this book, no matter how small their role is given their own story arc. 
uh, their own problems, and each everyone has their own unique personality streaks. The only flaw in the book is the amount. There's, there's so many people in the story that King spends a lot of time on each of them. So it, it's it takes a while to get to the action of it all, but it, it makes everything all the more immersive and impressive. Just how well how well he was able to develop everyone. And uh, yeah, when the vampire action does hit, it's it's beyond gory and brutal. It's awesome. There's a sense of adventure to everything, especially in the third act. And I was surprised by the end of how, how heartfelt everything is. And to me, this is a novel about conquering your deepest fears, learning to let the past stay in the past, and learning, and for, the, for me, this is something I still work on, and learning to move forward no matter how dark your future seems. And um, I loved everything about this book. It's one of Stephen King's uh, best novels and a good place to start for him. I'll have to try that Stephen King gentleman. I haven't, I haven't heard of him before. Yeah, you know, he seems like... <laughs> He seems like he hasn't been doing it for a while, but I definitely give him. I'll definitely. Exa- try yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> yeah, Salem's Lot. You can't go wrong there. Uh, so yeah, number number nine for me is we must be in the Stephen King section of this uh, list here. We're <laughs> at the Drawing of Three by Stephen King. Now this one I I really can't get into any of the um, storylines because it is the second book in his Dark Tower series. But it is when um, Roland is forming his quartet, which is his group of people that he will go on his journey with for uh, the Dark Tower and in search of the man in black. So um, and not Johnny Cash. That it's a different yeah. man in black. So uh, shout out to Johnny Cash. But uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so the drawing of three, it's awesome. There is a certain scene where my favorite main main character of the story um, well, he's a secondary character, but he's basically there's four perspectives throughout the thing. And he's he's naked in this bar and having this shootout with like an entire gang of people. And it's just it's so well written. It's Stephen King being Stephen King. And uh, yeah, the drawing of three. Number nine. Amazing. dude. I'm definitely going to check out more King. <laughs> he's just he he writes things that are so out he really just he can't do he just is out there man i love Stephen King. <laughs> awesome. cool okay my number nine is it's about time i mentioned this author especially on this list is blanky by keelan patrick burke is number nine it's a novella Something about the way death is portrayed in the story and grief. I've never read a book that moved me like this before in terms just by the prose alone. Every single paragraph in the story has a quotable line. Every single one. It's hard to read, actually, because you're you're rereading passages. You can't believe what you've just read. It's so good. He's achieved something truly special with this. And he's taken a skeleton of a concept that's in horror, has been in horror for a while, and he created an absolutely unique work of art. Uh, he succeeds in balancing moments of terror with uh, moments of melancholy and beauty. And when it comes to novellas, man, it's it's really rare for me to become as emotionally invested, you know, in the plight of these characters. Uh, and it, it's just amazing. The prose is, it, it really reminded me of people like Raymond Carver and Cormac McCarthy. It's his prose is poetic, but really fast paced at the same time. And each passage, it feels like it hits you like it's supposed to, but it, then it doesn't overstay its welcome. He moves on. And yeah, it's a masterpiece. It's an absolute masterpiece. Keelan Patrick Burke is criminally underrated. Dude is, a, is an absolute genius. Everyone needs to check out his work. And this is one of the best books I've ever read in my life, A Blankie by Absolutely. Keelan Patrick Keelan Patrick Berg is, is so great for the community and I need to read more of him. He is outstanding. So yeah, number eight for me is uh, the fellowship of the ring. Most people know the storyline. Um, these stories by J.R.R. Tolkien were the groundwork for me enjoying uh, fiction and reading for fun. So J.R.R. Tolkien I am a person who just lives in the Shire, man. I have the soundtrack to the Lord of the Rings movie on my phone. I listen to it regularly. Howard Shore is a genius. There's just so much for for those. I mean, watch the movies, read the books. The Lord of the Rings is a masterpiece of fiction. The man made entire dialects and species of people 
So, <laughs> yeah, um, like, it's just, I'm thinking of, yeah, it's like, uh, I'll never check it out. I'm a huge, huge fan of uh, Tolkien, Tolkien's mind, and I, I'm, movies are some of my favorite of all time, but, yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the writing, the writing, um, the writing is hard for people uh, nowadays to read unless like you grew up reading it like me, uh, it, it, your average reader might pick it up and be like, this is just outdated and it doesn't read as, but honestly, his overall arching uh, look at society that he went with back. Then, it's just, it's timeless and perfect to me. <laughs> yeah, dude, that, that's the biggest complaint I hear about it. just just outdated, like the writing style, but I will, you know what, this is going to sound cheesy as heck, but I'm going to wait till I'm like, if I live that long until I'm like 70 man or 75 and then I'll chill out and definitely check out Tolkien and, and check, it's, dive it's, into Lord of the Rings for sure. Cause he deserves yeah. it. Please. Number eight pick the fellowship when it all began. Awesome. Okay. My number eight is quite, it's, it's popular in certain circles, but I think it should be read by more people and not for the reason that people usually uh, flaunt it for it's mortality by this man named Christopher Hitchens. So it's essentially it's one of the most insightful and candid looks into a dying man's thoughts he was always against religion and he never bashed it in a very disrespectful way he, he for him he, it's just i don't want to spoil anything but it's very unique and how he views the world and his hatred is not so much for religion as it is for just humanity as a whole and how bad people uh, use certain things to tout their own values and belief and pressurize other people to do certain things. His, uh, his convictions towards his beliefs and thoughts about what living a good life means are inspirational, wonderful prose with really well thought out sentiments about humanity. Uh, and the only thing I will add is you might be offended. You might, if you are a very conservative Christian or you don't want to hear anything at all about the opposing sides arguments, then definitely probably stay away from this one. But I think for a man who's dying from esophageal cancer to be able to look death right in the face, essentially, and write about why he's not worried about it at all and everything like that is truly noteworthy. And it's definitely worth the read if you think you can. Uh, you're willing to hear his opinion, but yeah, mortality by Christopher Hitchens. I like that. I like that. Yeah. That that actually that sounds pretty interesting to me. Yeah. After uh, after reading Nick's short story, that sounds pretty. Yeah, good to me. exactly, man. Yeah. So that was. We're, we're on talking? now. That was my number eight. So we're on your number seven now. All right. So number seven for me is The Professional by W. C. Hines. This was also a shocker for me. I did not expect to like this book, but I read it very fast. You follow a boxer who is getting ready for his heavyweight championship fight, and it is in the most people's list for top five sports books of all time. It uh, it really dives into you know human nature and um, desires for something more. And if you just like watching you know um, like a Rocky movie or um, uh, underdog story uh this one's for you the character work was just second to none so the uh, professional i'll absolutely check it out you know i'm a huge boxing fan to me that sounds right up my alley and the fact oh, yeah. that it's so high makes it like a must read for me oh okay. yeah the no, writing no. is outstanding so amazing dude and especially if the boxing scenes are well written oh man I, I i'm really gonna be a fan okay number seven for me is wallflower by chad lutzky so another novella I'm always going to be blown away if, if an author, especially a smaller author, is able to just blow my mind in such a such a short span of time. And this was one of those cases. Wallflower uh, basically tells the story of a teenager who encounters a homeless guy and he becomes obsessed with the idea of doing heroin. It's extremely heartbreaking, extremely sad. So if you are a former addict and I am not, I have no problem uh, – disclosing that I'm not an addict and I this still hit me extremely hard in a way I was not expecting it's a it serves as a cautionary tale for depressed and impoverished youth who have nothing to do with their time really 
And this is one of the things, sadly, and, you know, we're both New Yorkers in Long Island. We hear all the time about people just dropping like flies, man, from heroin. But uh, the characters here are super fleshed out. You care a lot about their arcs. It's, it has probably the most beautiful ending to a story I've ever read in terms of the writing. Uh, Lutsky is like a, a ridiculously good writer. Uh, he His imagery is unflinching, vivid, but poetic still. Uh, he tackles everything very realistically. Nothing is glamorized. So he doesn't shy away from the darkness or the temporary light that is a result of the drug. So uh, it's a must read in my my book and easily number seven, Wallflower. There you go. Yeah, Lutsky is great. We're in the Lutsky hour right now. Uh, number six for me is Stirring the Sheets by Chad Lutsky. Wow. That, for, yeah, everyone listen, for everyone listening, guys, we I swear we did not talk about this. We, we, it was top secret. Like, honestly, him and I, we just like, we got our <laughs> list ready and that was it. So this is actually awesome, pretty dude. funny. But if you yeah. have not read Chad Lutsky, he is honestly one of my favorite. Um, I don't know if he's considered indie or small press, but... Uh, Dude can write his butt off, and he is imaginative. And Stirring the Sheets is my personal favorite. I own most of Lutsky's work. Um, it's dark, and you in and, and the sense of loss for the main character you feel the entire way. Uh, you're in this 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 old man has just lost his wife, and uh, he's he's just grief struck in, and and it just pours out on the page and. At the time that I read this, I had just gotten married. So it was very, it was, the scenes were even more vivid because you're just like, oh my God, could you imagine 70 yeah. years from now losing your spouse? It's just a horrible time. So Chad Lusky, Stirring the Sheets, number six. I need to check that one out too. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. My number six is The Exorcist by William Peter Blatty. This is, no need to talk about it. Everyone knows it. If you haven't read it, if you guys think the movie is scary, so I am a really seasoned fan of horror, and I read this when I this was the first novel that I read entering my 20s. So that's a fun little fact. But at this point, I was all into watching horror movies. I the movie does not scare me. I love it for its effects, its story. I was shocked at several sections in this book. Legitimately gave me chills down my spine, and I could not get them out of my head. Uh, Blatty is just a phenomenal writer i loved how how much he goes into the darkness of satanic rituals that's not explored in the movie it is some really really sick stuff like you want to talk about black mass and stuff like that uh the ending was amazing and it should be said i'm a i'm not an atheist i guess i have no problem i'm an agnostic everyone in this book was seemed like a real person and suffered from relatable human problems except of course for the main characters so uh it was it was a lot of Classic. fun over, overall and yeah exorcist nothing more to say yeah the, the exorcist is a classic it's so well known uh I, I definitely have to read that one i haven't tried it but i, I think the audiobook i can get on scribd so maybe that'll be my next audiobook yeah. but uh yeah number five for me is uh dark matter by blake crouch it is easily one of the most fun books we've already kind of touched on it. it is one of the most fun books I have ever read and I I read it and was left wanting more so uh dark matter pick it up read it it's just amazing so number five awesome my number five is uh whoever fights monsters by Robert K Ressler it's about this dude's 25 years tracking serial killers for the FBI don't want to spoil anything about it the opening of the book is horrendously messed up and it is easily the best true crime book I've ever read in my life. And I've read a bunch because, you know, me, me, me and Josh are into this stuff. It's not for everyone, <laughs> but it's worth reading one of these things, I think, in terms of just knowing what's out there. Like we said, meaning the depravity of humanity. This book made me terrified to leave any doors or windows unlocked for even a brief moment. Uh, especially with some of the cases. It reminds you of how suddenly death can approach you as well as how well hidden some of the most twisted people are out there. His pacing was great. Uh, he does spend some time tapping, patting himself on the back. But when your job puts you in front of, and that's the number one complaint on Goodreads, I have no problem with that. When your job puts you in front of the kinds of people he describes, I have zero problems with him reminding me of how much he puts on the line. So that's whoever oh, yeah. fights 
Whoever Fights Monsters by Robert K. Ressler. No, that one I got to, yeah. So I'm just going to have to re, just look at the timestamp and just find all these books. <laughs> Absolutely. There's, there's so many. Yeah, too. This is awesome. Uh, yeah. So number number four is The Return of the King. No real reason to spend any more time on it, but it is the wrap-up for the Lord of the yeah. Rings trilogy. Um, and yeah, you can't go wrong. Uh, the movie brings a tear to my eye, and uh, The Fellowship of the Ring is the beginning, and The Return of the King is the finale. So can't go wrong. <laughs> number awesome. four. Yeah. My number four is, and if you guys feel like we're we're spending less time on these, you're not going crazy. We are. Okay. <laughs> number four. <laughs> number four is uh, The Kite Runner by Khalid Hosseini. This is a dark, grim but very cathartic coming of age story that is very epic in its scope. I loved how it showed uh, two people from uh, the same place who start off in totally different social statuses, but connect in such a deep way. It's such a beautiful story about friendship. Uh, awesome. And another mention to Edward Lorne, because he referred to this on Goodreads <laughs> as tragedy porn, but I think it's both that's both hilarious and slightly accurate. But I think once you get over that fact the way guilt childhood burden strained friendships are explored in this are masterful absolutely masterful the effects that choosing to stay silent about injustice in your youth the effect that can have on your adult psyche is depicted in vivid detail and it has one of the most powerful and well done third acts i've uh, ever read and many people say it's too emotionally manipulative I'll always think that's a stupid complaint because this is writing. An author's job is to move your emotions. So this guy does it perfectly and, and tells one of the best stories I've ever read. So yeah, the kite that's runner. Awesome. Kite runner. I've heard good things. Yeah. So my number three pick is Dune by Frank Herbert. And this one was honestly surprising for me. It was one of the first pieces of sci-fi classical sci-fi fiction that I have ever read. And uh, yeah, the politics the world building second to none um, in the genre. And yeah, I actually went out and bought like all 12 of the books after reading the first one. And I never dug back into the series, but I've heard just great things. It's well loved and respected. So, and yes, you can blame me for uh, having to wrap things up. My pregnant wife has just arrived and yes, I need to uh, go spend some time with her. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, but uh, awesome, dude. Yeah, I got to I gotta check out a dude for sure. Okay, my number three is Choke by Chuck Palahniuk. This dude is, nothing needs to be said about him, so I won't spend any time praising the author. We all know who this guy is. Choke is simply one of his most underread, underappreciated, and one of the best novels ever written I've ever read, period. Uh, it's about Victor, who's a jaded sex addict, who has a very strange method of garnering sympathy from others. It's equal parts disturbing, hilarious, intelligent, and heart-wrenching. His ramblings are deliciously cynical when they need to be, but very poignant at other times. Uh, it's There's some graphic sex in this, so be warned. It's actually based off his father, who was murdered, who was a sex addict, so it holds a very special place in his heart. And uh, it's not for the easily offended, it contains messages about self-worth, viewing life as something more than just the sum of your past mistakes, and not letting random people dictate what happiness should mean for you. And he delivers awesome. these ideas just so well, dude. Chuck Palahniuk is a master, so that's Choke, number three. I love Chuck Palahniuk. Yeah, he just released a new book that I got to check out. Um, I've seen it on Goodreads. It's bouncing around. So Chuck Palahniuk is the man. Uh, so number two for me is Pet Cemetery by Stephen King. And this book actually has a scene in it that has like scarred me for life. So, yeah, I don't want to say. Oh what yeah, it is. I I know what it is. Knowing that, yeah. Yeah, it's a partial it's a partial spoiler. Um, so I won't say that directly, but um, yeah, it just sits with me forever that particular scene, and uh, yeah, it weighs on me. So, but it's it's also just an outstanding book. So. Awesome. main character is killer because you kind of pull for the guy the entire time even though he's kind of a jerk which is great <laughs> so oh and, and this is this is kind of like against the rules but one thing i forgot to mention for a choke i just remembered it is uh yeah. it, it has the most bone chilling twist i've ever come across in all of fiction it's not known for nice. its twist it's the twist to fight club is nothing that this the yeah. 
dude, the twist is insane. But yeah, okay, so that was Choke. My number two, and by the way, I need to check out Pet Cemetery. I've watched the movie. I've never read the book, so I got to do that. Oh, the book's way better. <laughs> My number two is Less Than Zero by Brett Easton Ellis. The dude is a, a genius. He wrote this when he was, uh, when he was, Brett Easton Ellis wrote this in class for a for an assignment, half of it. And the teacher said, you should think about getting pu- this published. And he did, and he became famous. And there goes his career, dude. So just goes to show you, I think people underplay talent a little but But yeah, it's the most disturbing novel about nihilism, aimlessness, and losing yourself in a devolving society I've ever read. Uh, the monotonous trance-like narration from Clay's, who's the main character, Clay's perspective, adds to the overall hollow increasing and increasingly just scary aura of the story. Uh, despite having social commentary aimed towards a different time period, it is so eerie to me how well Ellis's thoughts describe a lot of Generation Z as well. And it's impossible not to relate to it at the end, whether it be with the demographic the author was uh, putting a, the magnifying glass over or with the main protagonist. So definitely check out Less Than Zero. All right, so we've made it to number one, and it is going to be The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. It is actually, I bought my daughter a hardcover edition, and I wrote her a little, um, it's almost like a poem, in the beginning because I gifted it to her before she was even born. It's it's a story that's just meant a lot to me throughout my entire life. If I read something or see something or if the world's gone to crap, I pick up The Hobbit and I sing the songs in it or I just read about Bilbo and his journey and uh, it's just, it's life-saving for me. It's just, it feels like home, you know? So that book means everything to me. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, man. Like, I mean, that dude's a genius. So there's everyone knows that, that storyline, but yeah, he's a genius, and he built, I mean, multiple generations of people. I mean, everyone knows The Hobbit. So yeah, awesome dude. Okay, so my number one. Josh Shaldry knows what it is because I rave about it all the time. It's not only my favorite collection; it's hands down easily takes the cake for my favorite book of all time that I personally read. That is. North American Lake Monsters by Nathan Ballingrid. It won the Shirley Jackson Award. It's his debut, which just makes me both depressed and amazed. Uh, it <laughs> Few authors are going to be able to surpass what he's done here. I'll just say that, guys. The tact and beauty with which he tackles pitch black subject matter is just masterful. Ballingrid is, is from a different planet when it comes to his prose. His capacity for like, you know, vivid, unique and well-paced storytelling is absolutely mind boggling to me. He has an endless arsenal of harrowing and gorgeous metaphors and the plot lines are just so unique and they move so efficiently. His style of writing feels like a cross between Keel and Patrick Burke and Stephen King. And yes, it's as good as it sounds. The actual story arcs themselves are extremely well thought out. Uh, if you go into this expecting traditional horror tropes, you're going to be very disappointed. It fo- These stories focus on characters who evolve as a result of something very dark and an unexpected happening in their life. They are supernatural, most of them. He treats the horror in these plots as a darkness that simply exists in our world, as opposed to something that goes beyond human comprehension. These are all slice-of-life stories, which burrow themselves deep into your heart and mind. And my favorites were The Monsters of Heaven, Wild Acre, and The Good Husband. Uh, the, the Hulu adaptation is coming out, I think, October 2nd. It's called Monsterland. Read this book first, because I'm hoping they do justice, but I it's going to be very hard to do justice to something this good. And any horror fan that wants something original has to read it. So that's North American Lake Monsters. Yes, and Cyan actually gifted it to me, so that I definitely need to read that. <laughs> and I and to com- show you to show you how much I love, love it, I gave it to you, man. I bought you a fresh copy, and I bought John from Books of Blood a fresh copy because I'm nah. like, this, this people need to read this book. <laughs> that's awesome, man. That is so cool. Yeah, no, I I definitely need to before I watch the show. That's for damn sure. So <laughs> yeah, man. I guess we could. Uh, this has been awesome, man. Thanks for having me on. You know, you're yeah. awesome, dude. Awesome booktuber. And it's just so cool. Like you, uh, you know what I mean? You, you praise me so much. You give me so many shout outs. So I wanted to do something super fun with you. And this we have such awesome. great, such great conversations. So this is going to be something really cool for, uh, you know, us to go back and look at 
some of what we like to read that we don't really talk about because usually we talk oh, about know. horror. Or and I'm sure you guys get a lot of books to read out of this too. And I guess the final question would be is like, what are you currently reading or and what are you planning on reading next? So I just finished The Girl Next Door. And honestly, I'm, I'm in a horror uh, swing of things because of, you know, the upcoming holiday that we all love so much. And, and also I just, I love helping indie authors, but man, do I think I might need a break from dark subject matter. So I might pick up something nice, like palate cleansing, like a, I might do like a sci-fi book or something. And I, I might need a, I might need a week, like just like a couple of days of just reading something nonsense, you know, a little bit of yeah. fantasy, a little bit of that. But uh, so I actually picked up some like it's like a space marine book. It's like the ruins of Earth or something um, by. Yeah, I think two authors wrote it. So it's it's going to be like cheesy sci fi, just thrilling, you know, and then I do need to reach read your number one book um, before October when that show comes out. Uh, oh, I can't wait to hear your thoughts on that. Now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. So what so about guess- you? Awesome, man. So I'm currently reading uh, I'm, I, <laughs> Dark Matter, which I like. I got to finish that so we can talk about it. We can rave about it privately. And then uh, the next book I'm reading is I'm reading The Good, The Bad, and Sadistic by this really underappreciated extreme horror author called John Athan, a.k.a. Mm-hmm. Jonathan. And yeah. I'm going to be I'm actually going to be interviewing him next week, guys, on my channel. So I'm super stoked for that. Oh, so I, I feel like I owe it to him to read another one of his books. Uh, so and I'm the next book I'm ch- going to check out after that is your what the one you're sending me, which I'm very grateful for, is Israel Finn's Dreaming at the Top of My Lungs. After that, I'm going to just list a few names. I'm going to be checking out Exquisite Corpse by Poppy Z. Bright, Life Expectancy by Dean Koontz, Wounds by Nathan Ballingrid, Succulent Prey by Rat James White, Bay's End by Edward Lorne, 20th Century Ghost by Joe Hill. And the Ocean at the End of the Lane by Neil Gaiman. So uh, a yeah. little break, I guess, from a lot of indie stuff and just going for the big names. For Neil me. Gaiman, that's interesting for you yeah. to select. I like that. That's cool. Oh yeah, man. I definitely will give him. Uh, hey, man. Like yeah, his horror stuff and you know Sandman is epic. So I'm like, I'll, I'll, I definitely need to read yeah, some. Yeah, because he's got some fantastical. He's well respected in fantasy, man. Like actually, like he he branches out like multiple genres and i think that that's super and, cool and i've not and i've not read any dean Koontz, which is why i started with life expectancy because i hear that's the most dean Koontzy of his all his <laughs> one of it and it's a yeah. very good story i, t- I you know heard. he has a great series like he did a lot of reviews on yeah yeah, uh, yeah. Koontz. i i oh, yeah. know he you know sometimes he doesn't care for some of the tropes that he has oh, he but, said he uh, despises dean Koontz now but he said he's yeah. one of his favorite authors so he said life expectancy is the best book you'll read by him uh if you never read anything by dean Koontz before but it's he gave it one star because he said it's way too much like everything else he's read by oh, him. okay all right yeah I, i've read a couple of dean Koontz. I, I i enjoy him he's kind of you know what I mean? It, it's Dean Koontz. Like you, you just read them and you're like, oh, that's a Koontz novel. You know what I mean? So there's nothing, you know, if you like it, you like it. That's kind of one of those people. So I also should mention that Robert Atone sent me his collection of um, stories. He's got it's it's like a novelette in the beginning. Her 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 inter- her internal heart and other stories, I think, or other yeah. nightmares. Um, awesome, awesome uh, cover. And uh, yeah, super cool guy. He reached out to me. He actually wants to do like a chat too, like maybe on a stream or something. So awesome, uh, yeah, he's super cool. He actually emailed and he was like, uh, review slash hangout. <laughs> it was actually kind of neat. So he seems yeah. like a really chill guy. So I like when I meet new authors like that. So Robert Thanks. Hatone, thank you. And speaking of things I currently read and authors I hung out with, I got to give uh, this guy a shout out, man, because he's not only one of the nicest human beings I've ever met, he is he truly is going to go places with his work ethic, and that's Nicholas Gray, uh, a.k.a. Spooky Noodles on YouTube. Josh just reviewed it. Uh, his, he released a new novelette called The Thing in the Ward. It is it is by far, and I have no problem admitting this, I'm good friends with Nicholas Gray. I wasn't the biggest fan of his first short story collection. I thought he could have used a lot of work editing and just thoughts in terms of the stories, but he's going to re-release that one, and in the meantime, he has really, truly left his first really uh, good mark in his writing career with his novel, The Thing in the Ward. It is one of the best depictions of cancer I've ever read. I have, I mean that with 100% sincerity. It's in my 
top uh, 15 best novelettes and short stories of all time. Highly recommend you guys check that out and go give Nicholas Gray a follow. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and piggybacking off of that, um, it, when I first started my channel, I, I, I fell into the groove of um, if, if you were a friend of mine or a person that was just extremely nice, um, I tended to inflate reviews a little bit, if I'm being honest. And, and now that I've kind of turned over a new leaf, um, in being honest with Nick, um, that first collection did need a little bit more work. Um, but I, I really just respect him as a person. And uh, I did let that cloud my judgment a little bit in the first one. But that being said, this most recent release, The Thing in the Ward, was honestly one of the best shorter fiction pieces that I've read in my lifetime. Um, he knocked it out of the park, like I said in my review. And if you have not tried his work, please support him on that and, story. And I, I think, guess we should mention, not only is the story one of the best portrayals of cancer, uh, the author himself is a cancer survivor of uh, stage three Hodgkin's lymphoma. So it's just yeah. truly inspirational. Uh, and he's hugely inspirational. You know, for it's everything. just uh, yeah. and it's and just and I want to give him, I want him to enjoy this because he really put a lot of work into this one, and it shows. And really, it deserves to be read by a lot more people. So yeah, the thing in the ward by Nicholas Gray. It's ninety nine cents, guys. Go pick it up. Yeah, absolutely. And and I've I've seen a lot of love in uh, the video that I posted, and he deserves all the credit um, for for the work that he really put into this and poured his heart into it. And respect to Nick for that um yeah yeah he's just such a good guy and and he's a good author too so that that's that's super cool to uh i i'm just so excited for him to see all these good reviews that are coming in for it that are that are genuine and uh and and actual good looks at his work so that's awesome absolutely man all right man well thank you again for having me on man i appreciate it. i'm the first <laughs> author i don't like to think of myself like that even though technically i have a collection but i am i am just i'm a reader first and foremost and i just need to read as much as i can and always keep learning always being better at writing so thank you for Ooh. having me on man i appreciate the exposure and i hope everyone uh has fun listening to my voice because a lot of people I, i've gotten comments like man i wonder how you sound or like i wonder like what's it like like talking to him so i uh, hopefully yeah. i don't sound like uh <laughs> hopefully i don't sound too like outrageous hopefully i'm a normal oh, no. guy. <laughs> I, well, we're both we're both not radio guys i mean jay, yeah, jay yeah. maddox is the radio guy i mean we can't we can't live up to that <laughs> so yeah so yeah so uh yeah so thank you for coming on scion uh i wouldn't have done it any other way man you were the first author to send me your piece of fiction and I, I, like I said in my review, man, you'll always have a place on my channel. So thank you so much, Sion. And uh, yeah, cheers, Thanks everybody. Thanks so much. Have a good night, guys.